The publication of what have become known as the Pentagon Papers by first the New York Times, then the Washington Post, and now probably just about every newspaper in the United States has reopened uh, debate, discussion about American involvement in Indochina that hadn't been um, at quite this level of uh, interest or excitement or heat in quite some time. Uh, I have with me in the studio at KPFA today a group of people, all of whom are uh, eminently qualified to talk not only about some of the specific things that are contained in the so-called Pentagon Papers, but also to provide uh, context, uh, some interpretation of specific things that are in the papers, some of the things that are not in the papers. Um, this, we expect, will be the first of two programs. We'll focus more directly on, on specific uh, events that are recorded in that 40-some volume study. Our second discussion will um, await the publication of uh, at least the New York Times full series and uh, hopefully we'll uh, be a little bit more concerned with uh, present realities and uh, contingencies uh, than this discussion is today. My guests are going around the table. Bannon Garrett, who's with the Pacific Studies Center, Center, which is in Palo Alto, and the Asia editor of Ramparts, Peter Dale Scott, who, with Franz Schurman, is an author of The Politics of Escalation, Jim Peck of the Bay Area Institute, Ron Sherman of the Bay Area Institute, also an author of Politics of Escalation, Marty Gellin of the Bay Area Institute, and John Livingston, who is with uh, the Bulletin of Concerned Asian Scholars. Everyone who's here today, all of you, um, are familiar. The two people as having authored um, and spoken out uh, against the war um, and against the, the making of the policies that have uh, continued that war for more than a decade. Uh, and the, f the place where we might well begin is with you uh, telling us what you have learned from the publication of the Pentagon Papers. Has it been primarily a confirmation of uh, information that uh, you had before, uh, some additional pieces of information, but basically a confirmation of um, the interpretation that, or provides you with information that can reconfirm that, that those those interpretations that you uh, have stated publicly before, or are there really new pieces of evidence here that are going to lead you to reevaluate some of the either particular interpretations or general statements that you've made in the past? I don't know who'd like to begin, Franz. Well, just to <coughs> get the ball rolling, and and uh, I guess speaking as someone who's been a Washingtonologist now for five or six years, that the uh, first thing I'd like to say is that uh, the, you really have got to read those papers again and again. I mean, you can't just, uh, you know, go through the chronicle versions and then uh, decide that you've known it. I've been reading them steadily now in the uh, various uh, bits and pieces that have appeared in a variety of newspapers, and our institute has been trying to collect as much as we can of it. And I find myself again and again going back to the very first uh, uh, piece that came out on the uh, uh, when was it Sunday? The was it the 13th uh, 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 of this year? Reading Sheehan's piece, uh, which by the way I think is quite a good piece. I, I do feel Sheehan is Neil Sheehan has been by all odds the best of the analysts uh, uh, <clears throat> on on the Pentagon Papers. As I reread that first uh, that first piece, all sorts of new things come out that I didn't see on the second or the third reading. So it's a kind of consciousness expansion process, which I certainly if people have the time I recommend to everyone because there's nothing. There's nothing, uh, I mean, some people may have a bit more knowledge and a bit more information, but I mean, everyone can do the same thing if they just are willing to read it and read it and read it and so on. And lots and lots of things come out. Um, and people here uh, around the table, of course, will have different feelings about it. I can just state some of my own um, uh, um, uh, ideas very briefly on it. Uh, one, certainly there are nuggets of information very interesting nuggets of information that are buried both in the documents and in the analyses. And these nuggets do, do not appear right away. I suppose it's like nuggets of gold that you've got to wash the sand away for a while. Secondly, uh, there are uh, very notable omissions, as I think we'll bring out uh, during this, uh, um, during this uh, discussion. I'll just mention one of them. 
all the analyses get remarkably vague right around the period of the Kennedy assassination, even though we know that there were very important documents on Vietnam included in that collection. Uh, the third thing I would say is that the, the, um, the, uh, for me, what I, I uh, uh, saw as um, not exactly new, but it, it reconfirmed it, is the vigor and uh, audaciousness with which, right at the very early, very early days of the Johnson administration, the United States plunged very heavily into the war. Uh, there are a lot of interpretations of what's, what this could mean, and I think the general idea that Eisenhower, Truman got us into it, then Eisenhower, then Kennedy is absolutely correct. But there was a very definite turning point right around the time of the Kennedy assassination, particularly in regard to the whole issue of the bombing of North Vietnam, uh, which, as far as I know, is not prominently discussed uh, before that period. Um, just lastly, the, the feeling I have, that the sense one has if one uh, goes through the bland bureaucratic verbiage, after all, this was written by bureaucrats within the power structure and a lot of inhibitions uh, which they had to observe, but the real sense of bitter power struggles, bitter uh, bureaucratic conflicts, uh, bitter juxtaposition and conflict of interests that were going on in the Washington government. I, I get a sense of viciousness within the power structure as one reads these things. A kind of viciousness, I think, that is, uh, and callousness, that is indicated uh, by Barry Goldwater's remark that was today uh, published in the Chronicle, where Barry said, well, we should have just bombed them all at, uh, bombed them high form into a mud puddle. Somebody said, well, what about all the thousands of civilians that would have been killed? So Goldwater says very blindly, well, better they get killed over there than we get killed over here. But that kind of viciousness, not just directed against uh, inferior Asians, which is, uh, uh, which is, is quite obvious and from, the, from the documents, something Ellsberg has already alluded to, but the viciousness uh, toward each other. One does not get the picture of sincere men honestly seeking solutions, but of, uh, of men uh, caught in, 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 uh, in struggles with each other and pursuing a whole series of goals and, and fighting tooth and nail. And certain interests came out on top, and others did not. Peter, can I just pick up from there and say that uh, although I think almost everyone in, in America now is aware of the amount of <coughs> deception that accompanied the key U.S. decisions to escalate in 64 and 65, it's often seen as an escalation, uh, as a deception of the people by the bureaucracy. And, and what these documents confirm, and I think we suspected it before, is a tremendous amount of deception that was going on within the bureaucracy, the, the manipulation of intelligence, the suppression of vital intelligence, so that many people didn't know about key events in South Vietnam which were evidence of covert US, covert U.S. actions to heat up the war in that area until long after key decisions had been made in, in, in the case of the people framing the reports, maybe even years after that. Now, of course, um, there's always a kind of uh, bureaucratic perspective in bureaucratic uh, documents, limitations on what they see and they don't see, and that is, as one might expect, reflected in these documents. They talk about uh, a Patit Lao invasion in May of, of 64, and most of us believe that no such invasion occurred, or if it did, it was in response to provocations from our side. They talk about the second Tonkin Gulf incident as if it really occurred, and many of us believe that it didn't, that it was again... Uh, you should say, as is well known now, in both right. cases. <laughs> yes, so that um, I would like to warn people against thinking that they're going to get the real truth somehow by simply reading these documents. What they will get, if they read attentive, attentively, are clues buried, as Franz said, nuggets buried in these documents, which indicate um, the role of covert operations in adding to the pressures for escalation at that time. We should remember that most of these documents come from the White House, from the Department of Defense, and from the State Department. So what we have from the CIA is usually in the forms of intelligence analyses of what is going on. Covert operations as such, which were really the cutting edge of the U.S. involvement in Southeast Asia, aren't reported at all. But we do get clues, little hints, and that's what I hope in this program we can begin to get to. Ben. Well, I just have, have one thing to that. Is I, I get the sense that in reading this paper, though, though everything you said is true about deception within the bureaucracy, bad intelligence, et cetera, that 
that the two things seem to me relatively clear. One, as they had fairly few illusions about how bad the situation was, that in fact they were engaged in a what we would call a war against the entire population, that, 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 that any sense that they had a, an easy victory was was not there. And that essentially then that, that they are mucking around the whole time without any feeling at the lights at the end of the tunnel. I mean, I don't get that sense from reading the documents that they felt they were into some thing they could just, you know, if they come up with a correct line, they'd just, you know, uh, wrap it up in a six months or a year or 18 months and that'd be the end of it. I have a sense that, that a lot of their... Uh, these power struggles that Franz comes about are because of the objective situation they're in, which is one where they couldn't win. And in a lot of ways, they knew that, and they knew that they, you know, all these are sort of been holding operations for ten years in, in Vietnam. And uh, in fact, they say explicitly, we, it's better to do it even if we don't win. Yeah, right, right. That kind of thing, which you know leads to a whole different discussion. But I think it, it is important to have that sense of it too. That it's not merely because of bad intelligence or bad modes of operation that they uh, couldn't, uh, so we say, get themselves together on this, that the situation they faced was one that was uh, essentially hopeless from the beginning, and that the arguments were over how to hold it together in some, some fashion or another, but none of them, having, nobody having, a, there wasn't a, a, an ultimate solution to find, so that, that, that uh, uh, all these, these different uh, approaches were all, in a sense, equally valid and invalid <laughs> in the entire operation of the last ten years. Let's try to illuminate some of these general perceptions by focusing on specific periods of American operations in Vietnam that are, that are covered in the documents. You mentioned, Peter, that a critical period, or, or maybe it was you, Franz, that a particularly critical period was uh, the period immediately preceding the assassination of John Kennedy in November 1963, uh, that there are some problems with the documents in this period, but perhaps th this as a period of time when decisions were being made uh, information was being plumped in, decisions were being taken that would uh, culminate in the massive escalation of the war uh, within a year to 18 months. Perhaps this would be a good period of time to do a first quick focusing in on the documents. Uh, who'd like to, to begin on that, Franz? Well, <coughs> since I raised the subject, maybe I can throw out a few ideas. Um, if you read the... the um, uh, Sheehan's articles, and you read the documents, uh, not just in the Times, but in other publications, one thing comes out very clear, namely that according to the National Security Council Directive 273, formulated on four days after the assassination, uh, November 26th, on the basis of a meeting, as we know from the press, that occurred two days before in the White House, that is to say Sunday, the morning before even Lee Harvey Oswald was assassinated, a major document committing the United States to what in effect would be victory in Vietnam uh, was authorized. Now, on the basis of that document, you find in very early January, uh, January 2nd, uh, 1964, in fact, uh, 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 Colonel, or I guess it was Colonel Krulak, who was one of the people who was involved in, in the scene before the assassination of Kennedy in, in September and October of 1963, pl making plan or suggesting plans to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and to the White House for covert operations against North Vietnam, which were subsequently to be known as the 34A Ops, 34A Operations. And these 34A Operations involved actions not only against North Vietnam, but against the so-called border control operations. Um, um, against Laos and Cambodia. Uh, those operations, interestingly, and Peter may have something to say on that, began almost on the very day that uh, that General Zong Van Ming, or Big Ming, was overthrown, and the first of the military, t or, or aside from Ming, uh, General Yuen Kang, seized power uh, in, uh, in South Vietnam. Also at that time, the end of January, the Joint Chiefs of Staff raised for the first time the possibility of the actual bombing of North Vietnam. Now, we know that Walt Whitman Rostow had proposed that as early as 1961, but Rostow was not a major figure, uh, policy-making or policy-advising figure during the Kennedy administration, even though he went out to, to South Vietnam at that time. He, he was in the policy planning staff of the State Department, which was not an important bureaucracy at that time. But otherwise, none of the documents is anything mentioned about bombing. It just doesn't appear. On the other hand, what is rather prominently mentioned in the, do in the documents is, or, or excuse me, not prominently mentioned, but mentioned and not enough detail gone into, is the fact that the United States, 
that the Kennedy administration adopted a program for the withdrawal of troops from Vietnam, which was publicly announced on October 2nd, 1963, for the first time, a plan which, according to the Christian Science Monitor, was started to be formulated in, 19, in June 1962 at the time of the agreement for the neutralization of Laos, but which was not publicly announced until October 2nd, 1963. On November 20th, two days before the assassination, a very important Honolulu conference took place. These Honolulu conferences have been very important in the history of the Vietnam War, and they've occurred at various periods. At that Honolulu conference, only one public announcement was made that the United States would withdraw 1,000 troops by December 1963. 1,000 troops were not withdrawn, and one of the documents calls it, or Sheehan calls it, a sl uh, an accounting operation. I mean, they sent in as many new troops as they pulled out. But anyway, that was the official announcement, or at least the one thing that came out of the Honolulu conference. Now, what Kennedy had in mind uh, as far as withdrawal from Vietnam is concerned, we don't know. Can, can I interrupt, Francis? Let, let me just finish okay. one. I'll finish here in one second. The, the point I wanted to make here, in terms of the public of, of the documents themselves, th the talk of withdrawal peters out. There's there's, there's a, reaffirm a weak reaffirmation of an NSC 273 four days after the assassination. A few more very weak refer re references to it subsequently, and by the spring of that year, it's completely forgotten. I mean, it's a sort of like a policy that fizzled out. The point I want to make here is that these documents, there's nothing I've seen so far from that Honolulu conference of November 20th, 1963, attended by every major uh, official, including Dean Rusk and Robert Strange and McNamara, with one exception, John McCone, the head of the CIA. He was not there, explicitly not there. Although McCone plays a very key role in the, immediately after the assassination in the conferences with, with Johnson on Vietnam. McCone is a very hard liner completely in favor of 34A ops and sort of hardline uh, sort of operations. I just, let, uh, so I'll turn it over to Peter or other people now, that the, the, the key point here is on, on what obviously, if, if not a reversal of policy, certainly a rather remarkable shift of policy that occurred right at the time of the Kennedy assassination. These documents and the analytical articles are very, very silent. I gloss over them. If, if I could just add to that, th that same October 2nd announcement from the White House, which t talked about withdrawals from uh, of a thousand by the end of the year also talked about withdrawing the bulk of the troops by the end of 1965 and since then Ken O'Donnell has written in Life magazine that Kennedy had actually told him in April of 63 that he did intend to do this and to announce it after the election in 1964 um, my I, 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 I think we haven't been given NSAM 273 yet, and I'm really, I've been waiting with more bated breath to but see that. But there is in today's edition of the Times a very short version of it. There is. There is in today's version of the Times. A Be very because Chester Cooper, in his uh, book, and Cooper was a, an intelligence officer who was at the heart of these deliberations, says that a decision was made shortly after the, assa the assassination, which was that all military and economic programs were to be kept at the levels maintained during the Ziem regime. Now that's a direct quotation, and although he doesn't spell it out, it means that the policy of withdrawing troops had been quietly reversed. And if, in fact, as it now appears, that decision was made two days after the assassination, that's a tremendously important fact, which is not coming out with the publications so far, really, of these Pentagon Papers. Well, what was going on here? Who are the important actors in, in Washington in this period? What, what could have led to this, this apparent turnabout um, within a, a reasonably short period of time? Is there, is there some new fund of information, or well, what there's, is it? Um, there's both new and old information. There's a lot of information, actually, in Hildesman's book, To Move a Nation, and a variety of other publications. But um, in terms of what comes out in the documents, that right before before the Ziem assassination. You get the picture of two conflicting groups in, among the Americans in South Vietnam, symbolized by Harkins and Lodge. The Ambassador Lodge and Harkins, the uh, commander of the American military commander in South Vietnam. And then Kennedy sends out two people to uh, Vietnam, one uh, Colonel Krulak and one Joe Mendenhall from the State Department. And they come with two conflicting reports. This is all, all, all already reported in Hillsman's book. So one says that things are going fine. Krulak says everything is beautiful in Vietnam. We're winning the war. And Mendenhall says it's a mess. We're losing. So Kennedy says, well, what, uh, you've, have you been to the same country? I mean, that remark is in Hillsman's book and has been reported earlier. But uh, one gets the sense of two, that is to say that the command structure, Harkin's command structure and Lodge's chain of command were separate. And uh, the, the, the relationships between them were very bad. 
Hawkins clearly was involved with the military, and uh, I'm just, I don't know. I mean, uh, 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 I, I, I do think that the documents indicate a real split in the CIA. Uh, I mean, McCone and Richardson on the hardline side, and other people, Colonel Conane, C-O-N-E-I-N, and others, uh, maybe Hillsman himself, although Hillsman was at least theoretically in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research. But anyway, there is that conflict, and the, the uh, well, only one side of the conflict is clear, and that is to say the military side wanted to win the war against communism. That's clear. This is the American military side. The American side. military side, yeah. I'm not talking about the Vietnamese. But Kulak and uh, Admiral Harry Felt. Felt refers to that, doesn't he? In, uh, mm -hmm. in his report in 64, he refers to the country team being split. Who does? McNamara. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the country team was split. That's and they, just what you're talking right, about. Right, right. I mean, he explicitly deals with right, that. Right, and it's, it's mm -hmm. becomes clear in the documents. Now, the military, I think, was for winning the war against communism, whatever that meant. You know? <laughs> exactly what the other side was doing, the, the side that was plotting against Yem, as I say, Lodge and Hillsman and and uh, Conane and a lot of these people is very unclear to me. That they, they were plotting against. They had a slogan, though, which is "We have to win with the support of the Vietnamese people. We're not going to do it on our own." That was one of the clear issues before the assassination. That it should, it, it could not be a, a unilateral U.S. Air Force. We, mm -hmm. The U.S. role was a support role, and a, and a helping mm -hmm. role. And Kennedy re reaffirmed that in September. What are the relations of of these two two groups? in the American mission in South Vietnam to political groups or military groups in, of, of South Vietnamese themselves, the, the GM re regime and, and, and so on? Well, that, let me just, maybe others could speak more informally on that. Let, let me just say that of those two groups, the one group was purged, one American group was purged immediately after the assassination. Roger Hillsman was fired in January 1964. Roger Hillsman, by the way, also gave a speech here in San Francisco on December 10th, 1963, advocating better relations with China. It was the first time any administration person had sounded that, that theme, and then that was the end of Hillsman and the end of that policy until the present situation evolved. Um, wh one thing one can say definitely, that that whole group, Lodger, of course, remained on as ambassador, but the Hillsman, who played a very key role, was purged. He was out in January 1964. So that with the you could say with the uh, transfer of power that occurs as a result of the assassination, the military group, symbolized by Krulak and, and of course the whole military chain of command, JCS and Singpak and Honolulu, they won out. In other words, in, the power, in that power struggle centering around the assassination period, the military group won out against whatever kind of group Kennedy had gathered around himself that was involved in the plotting against Diem. But what was the situation in South Vietnam at yeah. that time? I have this. This is very interesting conception because it it seems to tie what was happening within Vietnam and what had been going on in terms of the American con uh, the American presence there with the very top level decisions in this split and then finally a resolution of the split with the military winning. Because what I've, in my understanding of U.S. involvement in Vietnam since probably fifty four, the early fifty four to sixty three was really this uh, New Deal liberalism reformism that was really involved with the, particularly the professors, uh, MSU people, probably State Department, AID, all these people who, who went in with the attitude not so much of straight anti-communism, but much more of, uh, you know, GM's the new FDR, the FDR of uh, Vietnam, and we're going to, uh, you know, build a just democratic liberal state, and uh, tried one thing after another. Of course, they're always caught in this contradiction of order and justice, right? I mean, they have to establish order in order to yeah. proceed with justice. But <coughs> nevertheless, a consciousness that we're trying to, to build this liberal democratic state, not just an anti-communist thrust. And in 63, particularly with the assassination, the entire pacification program just collapsed. And all, everything they had done, not only had, on the one hand, did they see that every reform ended up them building up a police state apparatus and, and centralizing political power rather than decentralizing and all this contradiction happening, but the very program itself had just collapsed by 63. And uh, the, in a sense, Johnson is correct in making the decision to go to the military decision. That, that the whole New Deal liberalism approach to solving the problem of American control of uh, Vietnam uh, ha was bankrupt by then. And it, you know, it seems to be the solution then was either to pull out or go to the mili try military solution, which uh, obviously has led to where, where the situation is now. But the perceptions at the top, in a sense, seemed to me to correct as to what was going on and the, the choices. And that, that uh, Hillsman and the, and the, you know, better idea people, you know, win, win, win the people over with a better idea than communism. Uh, it had failed. It had their try. They had seven years or eight years, whatever it was. And it, it, it was bankrupt.
these so-called nation builders, right. practically none of whom spoke Vietnamese and a great many of whom didn't even speak French. And they would arrive and get off the plane <laughs> right. with a briefcase full of plans and often <laughs> full of U.S. dollar bills and you'd think that they could somehow <gasps> manipulate some kind of alternative structure. It's, it's a very pathetic scene. Is, is this, in fact, what they were trying to do, is, is to create a, a viable alternative structure to that that was being developed by the insurgency? Yeah, I think that's a, that still goes on, right? I mean, they, they co-opted all those terms, right? Revolutionary development, RevDev, uh, and every attempt to co-opt what the, the uh, Dan Alpha is doing. But more and more, I mean, by the time it's a massive invasion of U.S. troops, of a half a million troops, I mean, the, it's like they're, they're counter, so this is going astray, but we might say their counterinsurgency model, uh, theoretical model, really seems to me have switched from the early model with Lansdale and, and McNamara and Hillsman and Rostow, these people, was really the better idea model. We'll, win, we'll wham the peasants, winning the hearts and minds. And by 65, when that had collapsed, their theory, uh, best put forward by uh, Charles Wolfe of the Rand Corporation, was a behavioristic model. We'll, we forget about trying to, to win their hearts and minds because you can't do it. We'll just control their behavior through reward and punishment. Huntington. Is and Huntington's the, the logical culmination. The of that, that, basically, urbanization. Which well, the, it, well, I think that's a working programs. out yeah. of a program mm -hmm. in that line. Right. It's interesting to think that, in a sense, these kinds of arguments don't emerge very strongly within these documents, right, partly right, because right. they're Pentagon documents, and they're a reflection of the kind of documentation that was going on within the military itself. I, my, my feeling is that this is why, in a sense, we sometimes think more in terms of shifts in decisions in Kennedy, because I think that where Peter was right, it's the covert side of the operation that was Kennedy's contribution to this effort. And it was the nation building and all that paraphernalia that was part of it too. But the military becomes very involved in that crucial period with Kennedy's assassination. I mean, that's when you start to see it really emerging in the documentation. We don't know too much about that yet. But I think that in looking at, at this particular period and you're, and you're trying to analyze the, the, the shift in forces, you have to remember both the kind of documents you're looking at, and these are Pentagon documents, but also that um, the, some of the, the, the critics, in a sense, or those who are arguing for different strategies, happen to be, in many cases, people who were around Kennedy personally. And they were part of his entourage, or they were people that came in through him. But during this period of time, most all the major bureaucracies themselves were already committed to the effort and they were had various types of programs. It would have taken, I think, a major reversal of policy right. to have pulled back from this. And with Kennedy's assassination, who was somewhat aware of the situation, he was involved in it, he had his own entourage, you find a whole group of people sliding out and a, a bureaucratic momentum can come into a much fuller operation when the head man is gone and you're in a period of transition and therefore you have to offer up to a new person. Here are the ABC's alternatives, and then you have the more clear-cut military approach that then emerges in this time. Is, is what happens then kind of a, a shifting of the spotlight? Formerly it had been one aspect of, of uh, some interrelated elements of American policy that had been spotlighted, the, the kind of civilian uh, building a, a, a different kind of governmental political structure in Vietnam that can successfully resist the, uh, the insurgency of the NLF. Now, partly because perhaps that isn't working so well or has, has failed completely, uh, partly because the other thing uh, has new advocates, the, the, the overt side, the more milit militant military aspect is now what, what will become spotlighted in 64. Yeah. Is that what's <clears throat> happening in Washington? Well, see, I think what Bink said is, uh, I think that's correct. See, that, that there were sort of two counterinsurgency policies, the win the hearts and the minds. You know. By the way, Rostow was not of the win the hearts and the minds. I mean, he was much more... Much more the, uh, bomb. Put, bomb, bomb. Mm -hmm. In fact, he, his documents are some of the most ferocious uh, mm -hmm. uh, in that whole collection. Um, but that and the other is missing. That, that's what's really critical out of these documents that is not there. It's just some kind of a major shift which we can infer from what happened afterwards that is totally blank. And in fact, the, the New York Times seems to have sort of missed the point by portraying this whole thing as uh, the U.S. was not involved in the overthrow of ZM, while a major shift in thinking was going on behind the scenes. Either they decided that wasn't important or they just missed it. It's still not obvious what's going on there. All right. Uh, so I didn't get your last point, John. What, what was, what, In other words, the, 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 the Times has portrayed this whole this whole period of, of, of decision making as one in which the CIA was was vaguely involved with the generals who were overthrowing right. ZM, concluding that they were not involved in a major way. While we're inferring from the from reading a very close. Uh, reading of the documents, that in fact what was going on was a major shift in thinking 
in the military in terms of what was going to work and what wasn't leading up to the assassination. I'm not sure if I would say there's a shift so much in thinking as you it mean is the South in, military. in, in decision-making I mean, yes. locus, because I, one of the things that strikes one is about the te Pentagon Papers, again, given where those documents are from, I don't think you find a rare affirmation of pacification programs and winning hearts and mm -hmm. minds. It's just yeah. not there in the documents. Yeah, right. One reason I think Rostow was featured in these documents from the early 60s, he didn't believe it either and fit very much into the kind of Pen Pentagon documentation that was going on. And there's a kind of a chomping at the bit of, of people sitting back, now I have the feeling, in these early two years, 61 to 63, of people saying, when are they going to wake up and sit? Yeah, I, I, I think this is where there's a danger of misperception by looking too closely only at Pentagon mm -hmm. papers, mm -hmm. because right, the, right. the Pentagon didn't really change in this period. Right. What changed was the White House. Kennedy was right. clearly becoming more and more disenchanted, particularly as Election Day was approaching, with, with the whole effort, and, and was beginning to tell his confidants, not his bureaucratic confidants, but his political, mm -hmm. personal confidants, that that he was thinking of al alternate ways of disengagement. This created tremendous suspicion and mistrust and recriminations in Washington. Washington was in a very bad mood those last two months before the assassination. Johnson was identified as a man who believed in the, in the Pentagon. And essentially, I think, what happened in that first meeting afterwards, that Johnson reiterated his position of before the assassination, which he had always been against the coup against Ziem. He had always been for... Uh, giving the generals what was needed, and he was going to see that they got it. And so that, that's where I think the, one has to look beyond the papers. You know, I think that's, uh, that, that is a, a good point. One, one thing that's always um, struck me is the, uh, the, the rapidity with which uh, the meeting was held. And as I say, two days after the assassination, and uh, while most of us were reading the, you know, on that Sunday. Is Sunday it clear at whose mm. request this meeting was held, or instigation? Uh, no, that doesn't come clear in the documents. I advise people to go back and look at the New York Times of uh, Monday, the Monday after right. the, uh, yeah. all of us were reading the news on the assassination and forgot that there were some items on the Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's actually in there, you can find it in the library. But um, what, what's always struck me is the urgency, and this may, this brings us back to the South Vietnamese situation, and I think uh, uh, a point for many uh, readers of the uh, documents that when the documents refer to the South Vietnamese generals, one has sort of an image of Thieu and Ki and, uh, and, and uh, you know, these sort of various generals who are at the beck and call of the United States. But actually, not, uh, not so. The generals refer to essentially General Big Ming. And uh, in fact, uh, a whole series of generals who were, when was it retired by Kaing? There, there was later after Kaing seized power in January, six, end of January 64. Uh, at some point, all these generals were retired. Now, these generals, and they emerge, by the way, in these documents as generals who were, in, many of whom, in favor of neutralization, of pro Gaulist sympathies. Mm -hmm. De Gaulle at that time was calling for the neutralization of Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, what comes out in the documents is that any talk of neutralism was regarded as, as treason, uh, treason by Vietnamese against yes. American interests. <laughs> Often yeah. when right. they say the situation is very bad, they mean there's a That's danger right. of the situation being neutralized. Right. Neutralized. Right. Right. Now, th this, uh, uh, you know, th what I say here is just absolute speculation. And I, you know, and it's, it's just, uh, and it may, may not be true, but it is known from other sources, not from the documents, that General Ming uh, was very close to the French. And the French at that time, both in Laos and in Cambodia uh, and in South Vietnam, were still playing some sort of role, an obscure role. So it's, it's very hard to say what it was. Now, it's not totally out of the question that, uh, that uh, Washington had to act in order to prevent the Big Ming government which at that time was trying to consolidate itself, knew how bad the situation was, uh, where there were lots of rumors that they were in contact with the North Vietnamese and, and to achieve some sort of negotiated solution, that Washington may have had to act decisively, let us say, this is my speculation, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, that their, their grounds for thinking this might have been so, act decisively to prevent a fait accompli, namely some kind of de facto neutralization in South Vietnam. That could explain the urgency with which John McCone, the head of the CIA, the man excluded from the Honolulu Conference, uh, uh, um, Lodge himself, who flew back from Saigon, Rusk, McNamara, all the big, big wigs of the, 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 the government, rushed in to see Johnson on the day of the Kennedy funeral. I, I think, in a sense, Franz, this is more than speculation because some of the documents do go into this. And what one has in the period of November and December of '63 are the two different perceptions that are emerging. Washington's fear, not only of the collapsing situation in Vietnam itself and what's going on in the rural areas, but in the capital, 
And there you had their own fears of neutralization, and that comes out quite clearly in the document. But from the other side is, I think, the perception of the people in the post-coup period in, in the South Vietnamese military elite at this time, which is the beginning of jockeying for positions in a post-war Vietnam. I mean, it was not expected at this time, I think, of this kind of massive commitment. You have all through the documents the decisions about bombings are related to do they build up the Saigon government from the American side, not from the Saigon side itself. They're all the American analyses of what's necessary to strengthen those forces in the Saigon elite that will withstand against neutralization or coalition governments. But what you have, it seems to me, in this period is an immense fluidity in the Saigon leadership yeah. in which they themselves are thinking in terms of the end of the war or at least an end of a period of insurgency where they're going to lose and they begin to scramble for positions. And the other urgency is because the Washington is convinced this may well happen. I mean, it's written right there in the documents that yeah. we know we've lost, yeah. and unless the current is really reversed, these forces that are indigenous to Vietnam will emerge triumphant. Well, what, I just, let me ask one question. Okay. What's happening from the assassination of the TM to the assassination of Kennedy? What's going on in that period, both within mm -hmm. Vietnam and, and, and policy debate? See, that's where there's, that's there's where the gap absolute, absolute zero. Yeah. The absolute zero gap in all the documents in today's uh, account in the New York Times that I just mm -hmm. read very, very quickly, that Hedrick Smith sort of ends at the Diem assassination, and the documents have Lodge's last conversation with Diem by phone, and then NSC 273, mm -hmm. four days after See, the assassination. This is what's An absolute zero up till now. The Christian Science Monitor had some namby-pamby pieces on that period, which, which said nothing, mm -hmm. which said absolutely nothing. So because why, it, wasn't, uh, why wasn't NSC 273, why wasn't that November 15th? It's quite conceivable to me that some of the, um, yeah, the people who compiled the Pentagon Papers did not have access to a lot of the intelligence covert operations that were being worked on at this period, I mean, which is the very crucial period for the undercover work. There's no reason to believe that this necessarily went through the Pentagon bureaucracy. Well, yeah, this, we're not, one not thing is, the Honolulu Conference documents must have been in the Pentagon. Because that that that, that would yes, you know. we have documents of the June '64 Honolulu conference. Why not That's November right. 20th, 1964? See, the, 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 the point is the way this was discussed is that there was a real crisis brewing within Saigon right after Diem's assassination, and there was right. jockeying for power. A lot of sense that you know there's going to be a neutralization. Uh, it doesn't seem to me, from what we what we said so far, that the situation in November 26 was any more any less or more critical than November 15th. And why is it till, not until after the Kennedy assassination all of a sudden this meeting is called with such urgency? Well, if the situation was so critical within Vietnam itself prior to that. I'd like to be blunter about it. I think that uh, a group of people met in Honolulu on November 20th, the Wednesday, and decided that things were essentially all right. And the, the Council on Foreign Relations history for that year says that they proceeded quietly to implement plans for withdrawal. And then uh, the following Sunday, two days after the assassination, the same people met again in Washington knowing the same facts, dealing with the same reports, and somehow the, the, the balance of power had shifted within that group of people. I think that's what the situation that's was. Right. No I new input right. of information yeah. at all. Okay. That's with, with this shift in the balance of power, is the road to Tonkin now fully paved? Is, is, that, is this what does it? Or no, or is I it think now we, we have to, uh, I mean, uh, let's just focus on one period. We have to think of Indochina, I think, and not just of Vietnam. We have to remember that all along you have covert operations in Laos, you have CIA forward operations with Mayo tribesmen, really right up against the border of North Vietnam. And those become very important because there is a, the, 64 is an election year, it becomes I think apparent that Johnson, although he'll authorize all kinds of contingency studies, is not going to move quickly in that election year. And um, I was uh, very interested to see the uh, treatment of Laos in these Pentagon Papers, because here is an instance where both the documents and the narrative written three years later talk as if there had been a leisurely period of planning followed by crisis decision-making in response to what they call a patet Lao offensive in the Plaine des Jars in May of 1964. Those of us who have studied that period feel, and for not only our own studies, but uh, objective books like uh, well, Dennis Warner, who was quite a hawk in some ways, or Hugh Toy, who's perhaps the most uh, he's suspected of being a British intelligence agent. In any case, he's written a very good book on Laos for, uh, I think it's Oxford University Press. And uh, he says that what happened on the Plaine des Jars in May 64 was not primarily a Patet Lao offensive at all. It was a response by the other side to a right-wing coup which had taken place in 
uh, in Vientiane, among our side, the virtual scrapping of the tripartite government, the replacement of it by a forced coalition between the so-called neutralist forces and the right-wing forces of General Kumi Nosevan, and that what happened on the Plaine des Jars was that a great many of these neutralist forces refused to go under the command of General Kumi Nosevan. And, and objected, and the Patat Lao, quite understandably, came to their defense. So what we had here was a, a right... There, there, there's talk in these papers of a strategy of provocation, and here is a very good example of it. There is a political change which is covert, uh, which is not noticed by the American people. In fact, there were a lot of false stories put out that nothing had changed in Vientiane, which was utterly untrue. And uh, then there is an ultimatum to the neutralist troops to come in under the right wing uh, forces, the result is a renewed offensive, uh, a, re a renewal of hostilities in the Plain des Jars, which the Americans then immediately use as an excuse for a stepping up of T-28 prop plane attacks on Patit Lao positions, and the bringing in, the moving up, this is, this is not in the papers, but it's very important, the moving up of aircraft carriers into the Tonkin Gulf from which jets take over for daily overflights of Laos, which very rapidly become daily bombings of Laos, mm -hmm. and which really there set the precedent for the bombing right. of North Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I, I just, <clears throat> I think with Peter, uh, just for the benefit of our listeners, that that period, May 1964, is a very, very critical period, because that's in effect when the bombing <coughs> of North Vietnam and Laos began, the American bombing. And uh, the, in fact, the air, um, a aviation weakened space technology of, of that June period, 22nd. June, June, June 22nd, 1964, speaks of the first U.S. offensive actions uh, carried out by the United States since the Korean War. And these were American jets taking off from Clark Field in the Philippines, the bomb targets in Laos. The actual beginning was through T-28s manned allegedly, I mean manned by Thai pilots, allegedly Lao, but according to the documents, under American command. That's one of the things that comes uh, out. Uh, the there's documents. a reference to Air America mm -hmm. pilots and, there, and too. In other words, covert pilots. CIA pilots flying right. ostensibly for the Royal Aotian Air That's Force. That's right, ostensibly for the Royal Aotian Air Force. But that period, and more exactly around May 17, 1964, was the beginning of the air war. Now, what Peter was saying, that in, this, in, in these, the, 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 the so-called Great Crisis was called the Fall of Ta Tum, T-H-A-T-H-O-M, which is a speck not much bigger than this room anyway, you know, and, and then what Peter describes is what actually occurred. The interesting thing, though, is that in the documents, the Pentagon analysts take that crisis at face value. They speak of a PL, Patet Lao Offensive, and the PDJ, and the Plain des Jars, as if this was a... In other words, that, that they, they take at face value what is, you know, at the very best, a fabrication. And at the worst, you know, probably something else, you know, but at the very best, a fabrication by the so-called Lao Defense Ministry or something of the sort. But these guys, they do that with Tonkin too, and perhaps others can, can speak better can, on it. Could I just tie it up? I mean, to me, the, the most important single fact that has emerged so far uh, from these documents is one which many people might have missed, and that is, uh, at the time of the first Tonkin Gulf incident on August the 2nd, 1964, the North Vietnamese protested that their land on the Laotian border had just been bombed for the first time by some of these T-28 planes with Air America and Thai and Lao pilots which were bombing Laos. And uh, McNamara denied this, all kinds of people denied it at the time. But we now find a document in the State Department of November 1964 which concludes that these attacks on North Vietnam territory for the first time on August the 1st and 2nd probably took place. And I must say I find that adjective, ad adverb probably as, as fascinating as the concession that it did Was probably that Marshall take Green's? That's Marshall Green's memorandum. The State Department hadn't been able to find out for sure whether they had taken place or not. The following year, 1965, the Department of Defense pr uh, prepared a top, top, top secret. Its classification was higher than top secret <laughs> uh, analysis of what happened in Tonkin. Only 40 copies of that report were ever prepared, and it was always talked about mysteriously in the Fulbright Committee as the, the secret document that had the real truth about the Tonkin Gulf incidents. But we now know that the T-28 uh, affair was unknown to the authors of that uh, special study. So that's just one instance of the way in which covert operations can give a wholly different picture to what was really happening and turn apparent aggression from the other side into, into a quite different kind of retaliation. And we have to deal with the extraordinary coincidence of the first 
bombing of North Vietnam by T-28s on August the 1st and 2nd with the 34A Marine operations, which uh, Golden says were the first 34A mm -hmm. Marine operations against North Vietnam on July 30th and August the 3rd with the further coincidence of the first DeSoto patrol to go in in the context of such covert operations, the first destroyer patrol of any kind in five months. And we're asked to believe that all of this was really happening just as the sort of circuitous and fortuitous uh, workings of history. Of course, the 34A and the DeSoto portrayals were known by the Defense Department at the time, and those come out as, as being part of the knowledge McNamara had when he was making all the announcements in the public that, of course, we knew nothing about what was going on there, had no role in it ourselves. Oh, no, but see, McNamara has said twice. He said in 64 he did not know of mm. the July 30th uh, marine operation at the time he authorized uh, the August 2nd decisions and he said in 1968 he mm -hmm. did not know of the uh, of the August 3rd 34A marine operation at the time of the key decision to bomb North Vietnam. Now I wouldn't put too much mm -hmm. stress on that. He, it may well be he didn't know because he didn't want to know. Johnson was saying don't tell me what's going on. McNamara, I, my guess is, also was saying don't tell me what is going on. But that, that's, that's a hell of a way to run a railroad. True, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, there were in some of the documents statements about those raids by McNamara's subordinates mm -hmm. in memorandum. Right. in which McNamara then denied them in the secret testimony before the Foreign Affairs Committee. And Rusk himself, when he testified before the same series of secret committees, was far more ambivalent than McNamara, who gave a flat no mm -hmm. to saying that these were going on. And Rusk said, it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to but of course, the distinction being, it's possible because the South Vietnamese are doing it, and since it's their operation, we're not involved. But what comes very clearly out of the documents is the extent to which we not only knew of the operations, but, but were them. involved Oh, training right. and protecting them. Right. So it was an essentially an American Sorry. operation. Are these kinds of operations then consequences of the shift in the balance of power in Washington that can be discerned in, in late November 1963? Or is there something changing in the situation internally within Indochina, specifically South Vietnam, well, or no, in I, Washington? That, I think that, that they were directly it. the consequence of the change in the balance of power around the time of the assassination. If you look at the documents, right, in the very first day, Sunday, the June the 13th. You see that on January 2nd, Colonel Krulak um, issued, uh, proposed plans for these 34A ops to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Now, the covert operations before then uh, had been under CIA control, and the CIA was carrying out assassination and sabotage and terror and so on. But um, in, in early January, January 2nd, Krulak uh, proposed to the JCS, in effect, that they take over those operations, and they did, and Krulak was put in charge, and shortly afterward, in February, he was purged or fired, and, uh, and an Air Force general was put in. In other words, that the Air Force was in charge of the 34A ops, according to the documents, from February 1964. And from that, you can sort of easily sort of see that some, some interest in using bombing. They always <laughs> talked of bombing by GVN, by South Vietnamese forces. Now. My, uh, what, as I said, what emerged from the documents, others from other from uh, other evidence too, is that that the 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 military took a direct hand in the kind of operations, the 34A ops, that led. And there were two kinds of operations that were involved. One were the operations against North Vietnam, and the other what they call the Cambodia Laotian border control operations. That's to say, operations essentially to interdict the Ho Chi Minh Trail and take out sanctuaries in Cambodia and a variety of other things. Those were the two things. Now. You find it interesting this gets back to McNamara. McNamara goes back to South Vietnam in March 1964, and he stops in Honolulu to talk to the SINCPAC people. Then when he comes back, he issues a series of 12 recommendations to the National Security Council to be adopted. Not, it doesn't say so explicitly, but the implication is that this is a scenario sort of going from 1 to 12. First you do 1, then you do 2, and then 3 and 4 until you get to 12. And number 12, that's all in the documents. Mm -hmm. Number 12 is the implementation of preparations for border, Laotian Cambodian border control operations and uh, pr preparations for uh, aerial bombardment of North Vietnam. I mean, the covert operations have been going on anyway. Lo and behold, what happens, NSC, when it meets the following day, adopts another directive, NSC 288, which adopts recommendation number 12. It's right there in the documents. Number 12 is immediately adopted. In other words, what McNamara envisaged as the la last of that scenario. Right. Now, the picture of McNamara that comes out is, I mean, it's a complicated. I don't see him as a tragic figure. I don't see any of these people as tragic figures. 
But it's the man who opens the door little by little, and the heavies just crush right through. <laughs> you know, I mean, and and either they feel they can control it, or you know, their 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 fantastic intelligence will do it. But once the door is open one millimeter, you know, they come crashing through. And and uh, m m my feeling is that that uh, I mean, you know, certainly the C th there's a whole CIA story that doesn't come out because as Peter said, there are no CIA documents in this. You know, but there certainly are military documents, and they show. You know, as I say, a military crashing straight through, and by March of 1964, the essential decisions had been made that led irrevocably, I mean, to Tonkin, and then beyond that, to the to the wider war. One of the things, and there I would say, definitely, it was a change, not of what what anything that happened in South Vietnam or any any change, except maybe, you know, the possibility that it might finally fall and the, the Vietnamese make peace among themselves. I mean, that that's a possible change, but clearly, the new opportunities provided by the fact that a, a president was in power, who was an uh, outspoken admirer of the military, a tough Texan, and, and had always been a hardliner in Vietnam. One of the things that has come through in my reading of, of the documents, and this has been primarily the, the Times publications, is confidence on the part of ev all American uh, officials, whether they're military or civilian, in their plan, a confidence that really borders on and in many cases becomes real arrogance. Mm -hmm. that their plan will be successful in spite of the fact that each plan that's tried is unsuccessful. That they, and they have this information. That the information may not get out to the American public, but it's known to the people in, in policy planning positions. And my question is, what is the continuing source of, of an American commitment um, that, that becomes re-emphasized with Johnson becoming president, an American commitment to fighting the war in Vietnam, to continuing to fight this war, not to withdrawing when there is a perception, at least on the part of some people, that withdrawal is a feasible alternative sometime in 1963, and perhaps the policy that should be taken. Franz, you, you mentioned before we began that th there's very little mention of China in the documents themselves. Is this something that, that comes uh, comes to bear here. Well, it gets uh, to the omissions. I mean, all, if you just go back and look at the Time, Newsweek, and uh, so on, they were saying, uh, not only talking about Chinese expansionism, but saying that we'll show the Chinese we're not a paper tiger. That was from 1964. Americans mm -hmm. and South Vietnamese saying it. You know, we'll show the Chinese we're not a paper tiger. There had to have been discussions on China, not just in the State Department, but in the JCS. The, you know, the, the word China probably appears a half dozen or, I mean, a couple of dozen times in the whole documents, but there's not one document, nor anything in the analysis, that, that, that suggests... Uh, the only thing that's come out, by the way, was what, what Senator Gravel was reading, uh, Dean Rusk uh, saying that if the Chinese come in, we'll use tactical nukes against them. That, and that and the Chinese were told that, I think. And the Chinese must have been told. And Admiral Felt said that, too, in the mm -hmm. Honolulu Conference of 64, not of 63, mm -hmm. but 64. Admiral Felt was quoted as saying, if the Chinese come in, we'll use tactical nukes against them. So there's a, that's that whole area of omission. <coughs> and, and it, well, there's an interesting... I'm not sure when the commitment's made, but I get the sense that there's more of a commitment, at least in terms of the decade of the 60s, in that 64 period, to actually trying to to destroy North Vietnam, that is to subvert it, to, 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 to destroy the existence of communism in North Vietnam, some sense that that's possible in 64. Uh, I mean, obviously, they'd, they'd hoped for that all along, but more of a sense of that. And then there's this very interesting one-sentence thing where they say, well, the actual attempt at, at a massive uh, attack on North Vietnam is contingent at this point upon the Sino-Soviet dispute, which may erupt into a war. And this in '64, they're they're thinking that this is there's going to be this war, which will give them a chance. They want to have it. They want to go after North Vietnam after the war starts, rather than before. Obviously, I assume that right. they think that if they attack That's North right. Vietnam before, that will bring unity between the Russians and Chinese. But if they let That's the right. Russians and Chinese get at each other's throats and then attack North Vietnam, right. they can keep That's both that, of them that out in the and, and then go after it. One That's might say that we're in a very the, that kind of analysis of real, of real politik. If that is what they indeed were thinking in the White House, <laughs> the bureaucracy is really reaching an asinine level. But th there's a sense in which, in these documents, one doesn't gain any realpolitik thinking. It's a striking absence. I mean, whether we're not being shown considerations of Chinese policy, whether we're, mm -hmm. we're not being concerned with great power politics, um, or whether these people were basically convinced in certain elemental assumptions, it's um, striking in a way that they say in private what they say in public about some of the concepts of domino theory. Mm -hmm. 
um, or whether it's the slant we're getting through the documents themselves, because we're dealing with Pentagon documents in which I think the fundamental criteria that is evolved is, does it work? And the workability framework is not one which leads you to examine assumptions. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make you consider certain types of great power strategy, except as it enters into particular questions. And so when you don't get any feeling for basic policy being reassessed at moments. All George Ball can say is, but uh, it doesn't work. I mean, it may be destroying Vietnam, but uh, you know, that's not important. It's whether it works or not. Um, and, and that kind of framework, that kind of bureaucratic mentality is one when, as Franz is mentioning, when you open the door a little bit from the civilian leadership to a military, it's a logical point that they'll move in. And I think it's, it, it's the civilian leaders in this point who are directly responsible in, in, in terms of this move. We're but I mean, let me let me add. Okay. I mean, in terms of, of that of that Excuse that kind me. of realpolitik thinking, is is when you read in those documents what they're saying about North Vietnam. Now here, mm. not only their misperception, I think it's an incredible arrogant <laughs> assumptions about what the North Vietnamese how committed they were, but the comments on covert operations against the North seem to be done without any clear conception at all about what that would mean if the North was weakened. On the mm, one hand, you have right. discussions that's about, right. you know, it would just, re, you know, we know that they're independent of the Chinese. And on the other hand, a week in North Vietnam, there's no conclusions drawn from that in terms of uh, American actions in this area. It's, it's, they, uh, they really are, I mean, all these great liberals are not that different from Goldwater. Right. He says openly, mm -hmm. let's turn them into a mud puddle. But you're absolutely right, Jim. They stay, the, the great liberals, the McNamara's and the McNaughton's, they do the same thing, you know. They, there's no sense of once you've weakened North Vietnam, what do you do then? You know, there's just no consideration. Of that. Well, they've, they've mucked around on that whole issue incredibly. I mean, at one point they're you know claiming we're in Vietnam to prevent communist or Chinese expansion, and then like just in the terms of the Laos invasion, they say, well, we you know the Chinese are not interested in expanding, so there's no real risk that by doing this we'll provoke a war with China. So you know we're not crazy, we're not you know China shouldn't worry you know, and you know, on the other hand we know that they aren't really interested in expanding. I mean they play it both ways all the time. Uh, with, I think, the same kind of knowledge that they know nothing's going to happen with the Chinese, in a sense, but they have no sense of a scenario for what, what they're going to do with North Vietnam. Uh, uh, so one, one question, I, we are running short on time. What makes these policies desirable? Oh, well, I mean, it can't be, <laughs> can, can, in, 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 the, in their minds. <laughs> Seriously, what, given the intelligence reports that they were given, it it couldn't be the fact that each intelligence estimate of every proposed policy said this isn't going to work. People went ahead with those policies, and in, in fact, they didn't work. You know, in fact, I think there's a long list of answers to that question. But but one 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 kind of question answer which doesn't appear from the Pentagon Papers would be that um, the whole aerospace industry was in a very bad shape at the end of 63, 64. I won't go into details now, but it's well documented from Brookings Institution studies and so on at that time. The stock market reflected it. And it's very interesting that as the Air Force starts to push for bombing in the secret meetings of the National Security Council in early 64, which is long in advance of the Tonkin Gulf incidents, uh, you see the Department of Defense going to a whole new series of uh, decisions to procure the kind of aircraft which you would use in a limited conventional war if you had such a limited conventional war. In fact, the, the month of February 1964, which is when this debate came to a kind of head uh, uh, in, in uh, Washington, is also the largest month for new contracts in aircraft procurement uh, for at least 18 months, I believe. And all of this was, of course, not publicized in any spectacular way at all. One also, to, to just expand the list a bit, I mean, there, there was a kind of realpolitik going on, I think, which never shows in the documents for the period 64, and that is the, 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 the kind of misguided sense of loyalty that we have to help the president get reelected. And actually, uh, one of the things that was happening then was that the president, in a sense, was holding back a series of forces for escalation which were not simply coming up from inside the bureaucracy, but which were being orchestrated in a very grand way by uh, the, the military industrial lobby outside the country, particularly through the Republican Party. And there's a tendency now to remember this in terms of Barry Goldwater, who's a bit of a comic figure, and so we perhaps don't take it very seriously. But perhaps we should remember that the man perhaps who more than any other single figure played the role of elder statesman and said it's very in important to unle unleash the South Vietnamese and let the war be carried to North Vietnam was Richard Nixon who went off to Asia, spent 24 days in Asia in the key period of uh, March and April, 
one re would like to know what Asian political figures he spoke to that time. It, he called it a private uh, trip, but he was accompanied by 20 newsmen, and he made a political speech in every country he came to, came back and said, we, we have to carry the war north. And I think a lot of the real politique for the team was, how are we going to help the president through the 1964 election? And then in 1965, one can really attack the bureaucrats themselves because they had four years of freedom and one sees this kind of uh, so so-called tough-mindedness of style which concedes a, a sort of basic inanity just empty-headedness when it comes to content you know in <clears throat> regard to that and, and certainly in the next program we can explore it more carefully um, Neil Sheehan I'll reiterate I think has done quite a good analytical job in these documents in speaking about <clears throat> you know the, the aims of the United States and South Vietnam makes a comment, again in the very first article, where he says at the in the beginning, in the Eisenhower period, that the aim was to keep a non-communist South Vietnam, or keep communism from spreading. But that uh, later, under the Kennedy and Johnson regimes, that uh, it uh, turned into a policy of, you know, the United States could not be defeated, or had the show it could defeat counterinsurgency. McNaughton, John McNaughton, says something rather similar. McNaughton also emerged kind of a slightly comic figure, although he died in an air crash later. He tries to, he really tries to make like a Rand or a military guy talks in a very hard-headed way, and, on, and it's, to my mind, rather revolting to see all these civilians making like military. And there are a lot of uh, academics, pro-Vietnam academics, who went off to Vietnam and put on shoulder holsters and uniforms and, and uh, sort of made like, uh, I mean, Ellsberg himself, of course, uh, was shown in the newspaper. Anyway. But Ma McNaughton says in that document that 70% of the aims of the United States related to not being defeated. 20% mm. uh, were keeping South Vietnam uh, out of communist hands and 10% out of helping the South Vietnamese. That's how he broke it down. Now that's, I think, a very interesting shift. And it does relate to what Peter was saying. Uh, the, the Eisenhower period, you know, and, and its justification that we can't let these raw materials fall into enemy hands, that that's well known, has been explored, you know, by left and, and, and radical scholars. Uh, but the shift, I think, is very important. Now, in the spring of 1964, if someone were reading the newspapers or the Washington Congressional Quarter or anything else, one of the most violent arguments going on at that time was between McNamara and Curtis LeMay, chief of staff of the Air Force, over the whole use of manned bombers. And McNamara's ideas were to get rid of manned bombers and set up a defense posture based entirely on missiles and, and conventional forces and to fight brush fire wars. And Maxwell Taylor had very much the same idea. And Maxwell Taylor not only played a major role in Vietnam, but a major, major role in military thinking in the United States ever since the late 1950s. So that here you take Curtis LeMay, the, the man who, as he puts in his own terms, fried the cities of Japan in World War II and who loved planes, a rather primitive character. But all the other Air Force types are that same way. Nathan Twining, they're all, they love planes. They love pilots, you know. That's, that's their life, their bread and butter. How could they envisage... By the way, McNamara envisaged phasing out the Strategic Air Command by 1970. There would be no sack by 1970. He stated that publicly many times. How can you have an Air Force without manned planes? You know, that was inconceivable. Also, you have to remember at that time, the Test Ban Treaty had been signed, that there was talk about cutting down on defense spending. In fact, there was a recession. Peter and I were talking about in 1964 in, in the aerospace industry in, in the state, the particularly. The finishing of a five-year state planned uh, procurement program was coming to an end and no one saw what was going to come. No one saw what was it. going to come and there was rising unemployment just as there is now. Now I, I think this is inseparable, these these conflicts, you know, inseparable from what on in Vietnam. I mean, Mac, uh, I don't excuse McNamara in this because the McNamara and the liberals, they were playing with their covert war and their, their finagling here and their finagling there. In other words, they were playing with matches, little realizing they were playing next to a gasoline tank with the gasoline running out. But the military, who clearly were not anxious to get involved in, in South Vietnam, never fight another war in the Asian mainland. Never fight another land war in the Asian mainland. That was their... Without mm, nuclear weapons. Without nuclear weapons, that's right. But they were, they were not tremendously eager to get involved. But suddenly around this period, you know, they are you know, uh, very, very eager, especially after the Test Ban Treaty. I mean, the whole Test Ban Treaty signing. So you have to imagine this, 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 and this, this viciousness in Washington at the time. It comes out. It's not... You know, just have to read the arguments between LeMay and McNamara, you know, sort of going on. So that what, what, you, what you end up with, I think, and to my mind, is the most horrible crime, you know, that, that emerges from this whole thing. I mean, it, it emerges even in the way one reads how General Taylor dealt with the South Vietnamese generals, that Vietnam meant nothing to them. See, even the Eisenhower regime at least wanted their raw materials. 
But but these people were using, they, you know, uh, they, these people, of course, they didn't want Vietnam to become communist, but they were essentially using Vietnam, one, to show that counterinsurgency could work, two, to show that they could beat communists, three, that air power would work, that they, in effect, were willing, and that included the liberals and the, and the, mm -hmm. the military troglodytes, they were willing to use a people to fight a proxy war against China, a people for whom they had nothing but contempt and disdain, to say is evident even in the documents to fight out their own bureaucratic struggles. That, I think, is, 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 is the, the, the most ghastly crime of, this, uh, of the war that comes out uh, in the documents. At this point, I'm going to have to call at least a temporary halt. Um, I think the basis has been laid very excellently for our next program, a discussion about those conflicts and about how they've continued and what part the release of the Pentagon Papers themselves play in the continuing conflicts of interest that uh, determine what goes on in Washington. Uh, gentlemen, thank you all very much. This program was produced by KPFA, Pacifica Radio for Northern California, and distributed by Pacifica Program Service in Berkeley. All rights are reserved. This program is the uh, second discussion um, among a group of people uh, about the Pentagon Papers, the material revealed in that well, actually not all the material that was revealed in those 40 uh, volumes, but um, at least that which has been published uh, by the New York Times, uh, the Washington Post, and now a number of other papers uh, around the United States, uh, excerpts, interpretive articles, and to some extent, particularly in the Times, um, segments of memoranda, um, internal government documents that uh, uh, revealed things that a lot of people had suspected for some time, but uh, provided some of the first real hard evidence to substantiate those opinions. <coughs> the people who are going to be participating in this discussion around the table are Peter Dale Scott, Jim Peck, Franz Schurman, Rick Busaka, uh, Marty Gellin, and John Livingston. Uh, we had a discussion before we came into the studio um, talking about the 25-year period, um, which is uh, of, of American policymaking that is documented to some extent um, in the Pentagon Papers. I think last week we talked um, at a number of points about the limitations of, of these documents as, as uh, uh, coming out of the Defense Department, as there being certain striking omissions even, uh, and, and we don't know if those are omissions in the papers themselves or omissions in what uh, various newspapers have chosen to publish. But there is a very clear pattern, one that we've all known about. Um, Franz, you and, and Peter and Reg Zelnick wrote a book about it called The Politics of Escalation, which I think serves as a convenient uh, conceptual orientation towards what happened, um, a, a repeatedly uh, escalated American commitment um, and American involvement um, in the politics um, and development of Southeast Asia. And I think that in this program, one way of, of starting in and, and looking at that politics of escalation is to examine um, threads of continuity um, and threads of, of discontinuity, moments of discontinuity over that 25-year period. There were different administrations, um, as the New York Times and the papers have pointed out. There were uh, two Democratic presidents, two Republican presidents, um, who have been in office during this period. Um, but, but really, are the continuities the most important thing? Uh, is this um, a point that, that should be focused on at this point? I don't know who would like to speak to that first. Franz? Well, we, I think the, the papers have uh, emphasized the continuities. In fact, uh, they've tended to gloss over some of the differences that we dealt with last time. Uh, particularly what happened in the uh, period immediately following Kennedy's assassination in 1964. Uh, on the other hand, I, I, I do think there's, um, I mean, one has to look at both things, but the continuities are, are, are very important, and in particular, the sense that one has, even more strongly than one had in the past, of the single-minded determination since 1954, perhaps since 1950, on the part of all the leaders of the United States, civilian, military, and covert to fight communism in Southeast Asia uh, with limits at certain times imposed by the real situation or imposed by this cautiousness because of the dangers that were involved. 
But reading those documents from 1955 when Eisenhower authorized covert operations, when General Lansdale went up to, Colonel Lansdale went up to Hanoi to bomb power stations and poison wells, uh, 1958 when General Eisenhower, uh, the National Security Council um, during the Eisenhower administration authorized a, a document calling for the unification of Vietnam under an anti-communist government in the time that Kennedy escalated in 61 and Johnson escalated in 64, that the sense one has of a, of a, of a locomotive moving irrevocably ahead on the tracks, halting occasionally at uh, places where the cows go across the tracks or to pick up mail, and uh, sometimes the uh, engineer wants to drink of water. But the sense of that mo locomotive moving on with great power and determination, uh, and that it's message. only been within the last uh, uh, few weeks, I suppose, a few months, that there's any sign that this locomotive may be halting or coming to a halt. Jim? Um, it strikes in a sense, it <coughs> strikes me about the Times series. Now, there may have been reasons why the, mag the newspaper itself decided on the order. But part of the way they've come out has been to make it even more difficult to put it together in terms of an overarching pattern. There isn't a chronological sequence to the documents. They jump back and forth. And I thought, in one sense, the most revealing section for me uh, was the section on the 50s in the Geneva Conference. And what emerges out of this, I think, very much confirms what Franz has said, that there was indeed an overarching basic commitment that emerges out of the late 40s and early 50s under the Democrats. And it's as though, though we don't see the mechanics of it, that the right-wing ideology in Asia emerged dominant by the time of the Korean War. And it was never to be challenged in any of these documents. Now, there were different emphases that emerged. Some people will stress national prestige once the military is committed. But the basic assumptions undergirding American policy, the anti-communist thrust, was there. And what, in one sense, I feel about a flow over this 25-year period is that in 1950, there was that period in which the right won ideologically, but the actual military presence of the United States is not that powerful in Asia yet. Korea marks one involvement. But still, American power was primarily European-centered. And what one sees in the 50s and in the early 60s is a constant struggle among various groups, all of within this ideology, but all moving towards a greater American buildup. There would be debates over traditional military versus covert forces. Um, but there's, there's a momentum here, which seems to me almost to be equated with the amount of American power that was actually available to move into Southeast Asia. And the overarching framework, the ideological framework, was set by the Atchisonian Democrats and uh, that very striking, I thought, 52 statement they had on how to deal with communism in Asia. What's the source of this, though? Is, is the loss of China <coughs> the, the, a most important source of, of this similarity, this, this maintenance of certain assumptions? Um, among, and, and after all, this debate, insofar as, as there is any kind of debate, is going on you know, only above a certain level. It's going on among people in positions of power. And I don't think that there's any question about that. But how important is, is China um, in, in setting these assumptions up? Or, or how important are other things um, in, in relation to that? Well, Peter? Um, I think one can look both to the geographic reasons and also the, the functional or structural reasons for this commitment. And it's the same kind of advisors, I think, who really have both of these interests in mind. So far as the, uh, uh, as far as the geographic interest is concerned, I think one can see from the documents, even in 1948, 49, before China had finally fallen, that if China was going to fall, then there had to be an, alter, an, an alternative U.S. base somewhere on the far side of the Pacific on the mainland. And the obvious choice here was Thailand. And so you, you have discussions about making Thailand a new bastion. And of course, for the Thais to be interested in playing that role, they, they wished certain kinds of commitments from the United States, not only in Thailand itself, but also in Laos, which is part of, was then part of Indochina. And it's very striking, I think, that the U.S. In interest in Indochina becomes very marked with the fall of China 
and conversely, that there is a revival of Chiang Kai-shek's fortunes under the Republicans with the, f with the 1954 Geneva Agreement. People like Joe Alsop, who had more or less broken with Chiang Kai-shek, suddenly become very outspoken advocates of uh, doing everything for Chiang Kai-shek, including putting him back on the mainland, when for a brief period it looks as if the Geneva Agreements might work and the United States might be pushed out of Indochina. As for the, uh, I don't want to speak too long, but there, um, the, the people who have been interested in foreign policy have also been interested in a kind of balanced uh, defense posture towards the rest of the world. And uh, here, too, Indochina has been very important. All this talk about preparing for limited war and developing ground forces was in response to the crisis of 1954 when the Americans found, essentially, that they didn't have the kind of ground f uh, forces to s supply in support of the French, which they themselves uh, estimated would be necessary. Um, as for talking about changes of, of administration, I'd just like to point out that underneath, just below the level of changes of, uh, of president and of party, you have really a very essential continuity, so that uh, a deputy secretary of defense under McNamara is Roswell Gilpatrick, who is a, uh, a lawyer for general dynamics, and now under uh, Nixon you have uh, David Packard in the same position, very important position where contracts are allotted, and he is or has been a director of general dynamics. So I don't think one should over-exaggerate the importances of a change of administration. One of the things that was talked a lot about when uh, Kennedy was elected and there was, the, was an infusion of new blood, of a, a different generation of, of policymakers coming to Washington. Does that, is that in fact true with respect to um, Asian policy? I mean, were there new faces, uh, but, or did that really not mean anything, that there, there may have been new faces in particular places, but that they were still getting their information and guidance from uh, the same groups, the, the same uh, interests uh, within the United States? Well, the, <clears throat> the new faces that did come in under Kennedy, such as Dean Rusk, uh, <laughs> <laughs> known for his uh, great statement in the early 1950s that uh, China was a Slavic Manchukuo, uh, or um, uh, General Maxwell Taylor, who has now been exposed uh, as uh, one of the leading hawks. So in those days, he was sort of seen as a very dashing, educated general, an exception among the generally uneducated generals in that period. But uh, it's quite clear now, and it was certainly should have been clear at that time if one had read the open statements, that Taylor was a, a real hawk on uh, East, East Asian policy. In his book, uh, The Uncertain Trumpet, in 1959, called for, in effect, called for preparation for a variety of limited wars to fight brush fire situations in that part of the world. And one looks at people like Roger Hilsman, uh, I'm forced to agree with uh, Joe Alsop, who the other day uh, attacked Roger Hilsman as uh, not just as a turncoat, but as one of the great hawks mm -hmm. uh, deriving from his OSS experience in Burma uh, uh, during the war and so on. Um, I think what one finds are that the bright uh, new faces that come into the Kennedy administration in 1961 uh, at least as far as the Far East are concerned, are aggressive, hawkish, and uh, I think as Jim, Jim Peck said a bit earlier, fully shared that uh, in practice that, uh, that right-wing ideology that dominated and determined American policy in that part of the world. And that's very clear with Dean Rusk now. There's a sense in a way in which uh, many of these people that come in with Kennedy were very much related to the Atchisonian group before. I mean, the Bundy is related to Atchison. Um, a lot of the advisors had family links, personal links, uh, political links that had developed over the years. And I think part of what changes in the Kennedy years is first is the extension of American power into this region. It's so much greater than it was in the 40s. And secondly is the Sino-Soviet dispute. And partly out of that emerges the counterinsurgency momentum. Because I think that most of the great counterinsurgency theorists were those who saw it as a way of living with the dispute and this was part of the way to, in a sense, roll back um, so the communist momentum in this part of the world. And these two strands come together with these advisors, but the basic assumptions under which they operated, simplistic domino theories, economic interests, etc., in some ways remain strikingly consistent. 
it is, early years. Yeah. It is true that some of those so-called new faces in 61 had been in opposition to Eisenhower's uh, defense and foreign policies in the last two or three years of his administration, but that was because Eisenhower at the end of his epoch was trying to stabilize defense spending, was increasingly reluctant to defense budgets, and it's really one of the most important uh, events domestically in the United States was the, the, the mini recession of 1957 and the kind of private planning which went on in Wall Street circles, the Council of Foreign Relations, in response to that mini recession. Those were the, 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 the people like Roswell Gilpatrick again, uh, who, um, uh, trying to kill two birds with one stone. Simon developed ground forces so that you could fight a limited war, which uh, they found they couldn't do in 54, and also uh, develop a, a program for greatly increased defense spending. Both of these were advocated by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund Panel 2 report in 1957. Many of the people who took part in those discussions under uh, Nelson Rockefeller and his, and his brother Lawrence were the same people whom Kennedy brought into his Democratic administration in 1961. So that the, the superficial debate uh, conceals uh, the, the people who become the opposition in 57 are the people really who are most interested in sustaining mm -hmm. this momentum in, 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 in Asia. Is it important then to identify or, or can one identify um, any kind of significant turning points, either in a strategic or, or a tactical sense, at various points during this 25-year period. Um, is, is that something that's worth, worth doing on the basis of, of uh, at least in part on the basis of the additional evidence provided by uh, the Pentagon Papers? Well, I'd just <clears throat> suggest a few, and perhaps then we can move on to other points of the discussion. Um, I personally think Kennedy was thinking of pulling out of Vietnam and was in contact with the French for that purpose. And um, that uh, he was doing that in opposition and probably in secrecy from all the high officials of his government, Dean Rusk, Maxwell Taylor, um, Robert McNamara, uh, probably not from Bobby Kennedy. Uh, as, as I indicated last time, that this is the most obscure and vague period. And uh, it was quickly quashed. Kennedy's assassination ended that possibility. And uh, Johnson was obsessed with the uh, fear that uh, South Vietnam could go neutralist and contrived a coup against the <coughs> general in charge, Big Ming, and was ousted. And from late January 1964, the last days of January, all the pieces were in place for revving up the motors of the locomotive and going full steam ahead. The 34A ops were launched. Kying, an American puppet, was in power. A pro-war uh, staff was uh, holding the reins in Washington. Uh, the military was calling the shots. The American military was calling the shots. And uh, there was uh, uh, no uh, fear any longer that uh, General de Gaulle or the French, who still had considerable uh, influence in that part of the world, could do anything. Um, that was, I think, a, a, a mini turning point uh, which came to nothing. The more important turning point, of course, is the turning point uh, of centering around March 1968, uh, which uh, was a definite de-escalation, as was November, as October 1968. We, we don't know anything about October 68. The study peters out uh, around March 68. March, uh, and April 1668. But those turning points uh, relate to what is now the real turning point, what seems to be a, an approaching climax uh, in this war. So perhaps we might discuss that in, in that context. But earlier, I, I see nothing uh, from 1954 on. I see, I see no, except for that period in the last uh, month or so of Kennedy's life, I mm. see no real turning point. Like turning point. Can, can I generalize a bit about that? I think most presidents tend to come in, uh, secretly at any rate, as hawks and to go out as doves. They have to come in as hawks. Secretly as mm. hawks and secretly as doves. <laughs> they, <go out. laughs> they, 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 they come in uh, planning to go somewhere because they really, to finance an election, you have to have the support of big defense contractors. There's just no doubt about that. 
But I think Eisenhower in his last years was uh, not so much in Asia, but generally <coughs> trying to do something about defense spending. I think Kennedy certainly was in, in that last period before he was assassinated, and Johnson in 68, I think, having tried to win as a hawk, was beginning to see that it couldn't. Incidentally, I'm quarreling here with the, the New York Times estimate because uh, Hedrick Smith in his two articles that I read was trying to suggest that the unlimited commitment came in 1961 and we've been okay. in a sense coasting mm -hmm. from there. And, and uh, I think it's just very clear if you see the enormous debate going on in this country in 1963 and the very powerful lobbying from spokesmen, some of them avowed spokesmen for the oil interests, calling calling for an unlimited commitment in Vietnam and saying in print that what was what wrong with our effort in Vietnam was that up to now it had not been unlimited and it had to be unlimited before it would work is is adequate documentation that there there was that kind of pressure at that time and I think the first document which could be called the, the basis for an unlimited commitment was NSAM 273 which was reached two days after the Kennedy assassination before we get into uh, discussing the limits, the points at which limits were proposed and, and finally set on what had been an escalating commitment, I wonder, were there any challenges, and, and this would deal primarily with the period of the 50s, challenges to this policy that were posed from outside the policy-making elite that had either no significant impact or, or no impact whatsoever, or were there simply no challenges posed? even by people on the outside. And that's something, something well, that... Well, there's the famous case of George Ball. <laughs> <laughs> the, but, uh, but, I mean, <laughs> you, I, I was wondering primarily, though, you about know, the, the 50s. 50s. No, I think really there wasn't. That What one sees in the 50s, in order to have an effective opposition from without, you have to have some sort of ideological alternative. And what was striking about the 50s was the extent to which liberals and the right in this country could come together on basic assumptions. They could be containment, they could come together on theories of nation building. They wouldn't share the arguments, but on basic conclusions they would be there. Theories about totalitarianism would fit together as well. And in a sense, the, the, the liberal uh, approach in this country, which came to be known as nation building and modernization, um, was really the domestic ideology which disguised the operations which was unrelentingly harsh um, and, and conservative. I mean, the, the ideology in a sense of nation building can be considered liberal, but the impact itself has nothing of this. And, and yet, if you're going to have an effective critique, I mean, one which really provides an alternative to, uh, to uh, policy, you have to go far beyond this. And there isn't either in the documents themselves nor in retrospect back onto that period um, in, uh, a framework for an alternative. Mm -hmm. uh, what, about, what about resistance from within South Vietnam itself to the policy? There, I remember reading something about uh, Diem being uh, nervous about American troops being brought in. The Vietnamese are a very nationalist and uh, proud people. Certainly the Buddhists played a role uh, for several years, a very important role. Uh, what about that role? Why was that uh, so easily well, overrun? That's, uh, that's, uh, not only Ziem, but uh, a premier by the name of Quat, who uh, in the spring of 1965, after the bombing had started, was, and this is not just evident, this is not so much evident from the documents, from other things that have been published since then, did not want to see a massive number of Americans coming to South Vietnam. So he was dumped, too. He was dumped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the United States dumped him and put in General Key. And in fact, there is a thread that goes through the, the, the <coughs> South Vietnamese side all the way to the sending of American ground combat troops and Marshal Key's assumption of power, which occur at the same time, more or less, uh, that the South Vietnamese don't want to see all those foreigners there, and uh, uh, for a variety of reasons. So that they're, they're, then, then the, the thing that we've been reading about, the, 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 the tendencies toward neutralism, uh, that knew himself, uh, uh, Pr President Ziem's brother was in contact with the North Vietnamese uh, and some indication that Ziem himself may have been in contact with the Vietnamese. I mean, the Vietnamese always have been talking together. And, and so Madame Nu has just confirmed this in a radio broadcast in the last week. Something that, that has increasingly struck me, partly because of, of all the material that, that has been published and, and all the, the thought that is being given to, the, to these issues again, is um, the degree to which America's great largely technological power um, gradually eliminated all the alternatives 
that existed other than the two that the ideology behind the policy always insisted were the only two that existed. Either we go in and resist communism or communism takes over. Um, and, and that's even putting it very starkly, but that there is this process of, of destroying um, opposition to uh, any kind of client regime that the United States has uh, within South Vietnam and, and to changing the faces in the client regime itself um, at any point when they indicate that they want some independence of action. So that the important question then becomes, uh, or, or the important issue then becomes, that the only way that limits are in fact set on this power is within the elite itself. Um, and and the, I think what we should explore now is the reasons why at various points in time people did try to drive cows across the track in front of the locomotive. Um, and and perhaps even more uh, dramatic things than that. But it seems to me, in a sense, we're we're in a, in a, entering in a different period because of the American defeat. It opens up possibilities for greater limits to be thrown in the way of of of, of the of the war machine. And there are indications in the past, which I'm sure we'll go into in a minute, in terms of of points. But another aspect, which I think is going to be increasingly apparent, is that this stress upon anti-communism. And the way in which it was applied was also one which, for all practical purposes, eliminated the concepts of allies, except those who were subordinate. And it's a striking commentary on the 50s and early 60s that the Europeans and the Japanese play a strictly subordinate role. They, at the best, are hindrances and, I mean, at worst hindrances and at best, allies in the effort. But the American power is so immense in this period that it can quite literally um, overlook what a lesser power would have to do in dealing with Indochina, and also what a power would have to do who worked in more traditional balances of power or um, worked actually with various allies, which the United States was not prepared to do in this period. I mean, the flip side of isolationism, some have commented, is a type of globalism, one which isn't willing to work with other allies or other powers. And I think that's another aspect which is beginning to shift, which is going to throw back on some of the roadblocks that are thrown in the way of uh, America. Yeah, were there points in the 50s, in, in the Truman and Eisenhower administrations, uh, when people within the policymaking uh, positions, the policymaking elite, were, were thinking about hesitating, about limiting uh, the well, commitment of American power in Indochina? Well, one very interesting thing that does come out of the papers is that uh, uh, the military itself was very hesitant, uh, at least about intervening in uh, 1954, um, which seems, you know, a stark contrast to, to the kind of uh, view we have of, of the, the military uh, in the 60s, where, where they're, they're just, you know, they have to be held back by the leash. They're, they're dying for more and more, but it, uh, uh, it, it was very interesting that, um, I think it was, when was it, in April, no, May of uh, 1954, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, told Eisenhower that uh, uh, they believed, and you know, this is a quote, that Indochina um, uh, uh, with reference to the Far East as a whole, Indochina is devoid of decisive military objectives, and the allocation of more than token U.S. armed forces in Indochina would be a serious diversion of limited U.S. capabilities. And uh, I mean, the documents seem to point this up. Where, where there are uh, various uh, other points as well. They're, they're very um, um, not not well, I should say not eager, you know, to send in troops. And and this probably has a lot to do with the, I'm sure the situation in Korea and also Europe at the same time. But uh, it seems there's tremendous hesitancy from, from the military for any uh, uh, really massive type inter intervention as, as we found in the, in the 60s. When, when was it so that that changed? Was that as early as 61 that the military had changed their minds? Well, or is that is, really in 63? I think uh, what, what Marty has been alluding to is, uh, is, you know, is a very major problem. I mean, what led <clears throat> to a situation where a military, which had been rather cautious, around 1954, in fact was cautious in the late 1940s, and even economy-minded, uh, turning into a wild beast uh, frothing at the mouth in the early 1960s. Now there's some evidence of what happened in the late 1940s, that uh, the, arm, the, the armed forces were cautious in 1948, then a lot of the State Department officials came in with vast new spending programs and uh, uh, the uh, Soviet explosion of an atomic weapon and so on, and uh, of course then the China thing and the Korean War. And during the Korean War, the military is ready to undertake uh, the liberation of China by armed force, and is then restrained only with difficulty. Then resumes a cautious posture for, for the 
50s, a considerable part thereof. In come the Democrats again, the Kennedy types, the Rockefeller brothers, you know, shouting, national security is menaced, and, and so on. And by 1961, 62, the military takes on the form that uh, is very familiar from the documents. Uh, it seems to be a, a it's just a variation of a, of a metaphor I suggested last week of the liberals opening the door and the heavies rushing through. It's it's the the, 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 the kindly intelligent dog trainers feeding more and more red meat to their dogs and then finally making them so hungry and that, that they're ready to burst out of their cages. <laughs> Wait. So but that that I think is sort of roughly the, the uh, and then the dogs start devouring the uh, the, the, the the masters themselves. Uh, I, I have a feeling that if one were to read Thucydides or other classic military histories, one would find similar things uh, happening. I would th think to some extent that, that it, it's really the, maybe the, the Korean War which uh, might have made the military so hesitant because what struck me about this, this statement is that's very similar to, to s statements I've seen today coming out of the military where they're in a position mm -hmm. that isn't too different from 1954 where they, they've just come out of a really bloody war which was a stalemate and in this case, it was, the situation was much worse than in Korea. Uh, and uh, they, were, they were very uh, uh, um, reluctant to, to, to make any other types of military commitments anywhere else in the world. And uh, I think that uh, um, it was very interesting, especially about this, this statement 54 from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, is that um, the military is in a similar position now, and the obvious conclusion is 10 years from now, you know, they're, they're going to be and just biting at the leash, ready to go off again. Okay. I think it's a bit misleading, though, just to quote that one statement from 1954. They didn't want to put troops in there. I think Admiral Radford would have been quite happy to drop an atomic bomb on the country, <laughs> and, some, and the Air Force would have been, too. It, they really did object to limited warfare. And that's when you get this opposition that I was talking about earlier, which is in direct response to the failure in Indochina and the failure to get the American position at Geneva. Uh, it's, it's a precisely generals like General Taylor who say, yes, we can develop a capable, uh, capability in conventional warfare. And what you have in the Kennedy administration is that those, those generals, new kinds of generals, are now put into high position. And it's important to remember that Westmoreland is a, is a Taylor general. They, they're both uh, paratroopers. Just, uh, our paratroopers have uh, played a big role, just as the French paratroopers mm. played a big role in Indochina and Algeria. And I think one could develop that Maybe analogy. Stop the analogy to a certain point. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's to be remembered also that in the early um, Kennedy years, well, he came in on uh, missile gap and toughness and all the rest of it. That produced money to close the gap. And it also uh, produced money to do, you know, limited warfare uh, preparedness. But then on top of that, there were two events. There was the Berlin mobilization, and there was the, uh, the Cuba episode, each of which, I would guess, was um, at the minimum damaging to the ego of the military and to the sense of strength and uh, uh, American power. And this, between the new money is available, the political prestige that had been uh, uh, staked on those things and on coming into power behind the missile camp. Between this, uh, all this set of things, I can see uh, both a material and a sort of ideological reason for uh, seizing on the opportunity of Vietnam to go and go ahead. Now, to fill that out, there was a third crisis, which was perhaps at least as important, which was Laos. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know, I mean, we, we had pretty mm -hmm. adequate documentation as to what the, the Joint Chiefs were ask, pushing on Kennedy in those first weeks of his administration. And they were talking about going in with fifty to 60,000 troops. Mm -hmm. But, and this is where the Korean memory comes in, only if they could be backed up with the right to use nuclear weapons if necessary. And uh, you, you hear a lot about the never another Korea club in the, uh, in the uh, forces. That doesn't mean we never want to fight another land war. That means we never want to fight another land war where Without we don't weapons. have the opportunity to use nuclear weapons. And I think, as far as China was concerned, some kind of uh, concession along those lines what was given to the military under the Johnson administration. This, I, I'm, I think it's very important that, uh, that we raise the issue of nuclear weapons again especially now that the possibilities of an escalation are not as great as they were six or seven months ago. And some of us in the Bay Area Institute were here at this microphone talking about the possibility of using nuclear weapons. But what's come out in the documents and in some of the things that Senator Gravel has read is quite clearly that, that tactical nuclear weapons or some variant thereof did play a role in the whole uh, Indochina situation. Now, 
Rusk uh, at one point was quoted by Gravel, and Admiral Felt is is is, is reported to have said in the Honolulu Conference of 1964, of June 1964, <laughs> that if the Chinese intervene, we have to use tactical nuclear weapons. Rusk said that clearly. Mm -hmm. So that a kind of doctrine emerged at that time that if the Chinese intervene, uh, and I've heard it stretched even to if the North Vietnamese should intervene massively in Laos or, 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 or South Vietnam, but in any case, if the Chinese intervene, then you've got to use nuclear weapons. That, I think, became fixed doctrine in the, uh, uh, in the military. Now, that, uh, that uh, uh, threat to use nuclear weapons, I think, has to be seen in the context of what was a rapidly escalating air war, which was being planned and thought about from the days immediately after the Kennedy assassination. The 34A ops that, that uh, General Krulak uh, proposed on the 2nd of January, 1964, already had in it, implied in it, a series of escalatory steps leading to the bombing of North Vietnam. So the, the bombing plans were laid out mm -hmm. at, that, at that very early period. Co 34A Ops covert operations were to lead to overt bombing. Now, overt bombing immediately brought the question of, uh, of China in. It certainly brought the question of Russia in the sense that there were that uh, Russian ships came into Haiphong Harbor. And the reason for not bombing Haiphong was always that it could, uh, that it, that, uh, it could hit a Russian ship. Uh, Dean Rusk said in one of his interviews, he said, uh, well, um, if we, if we uh, had a confrontation with the Russians, they could make trouble for us in East Germany. They have an old woman and 50 men to cut the <coughs> highway between East and West Germany. But uh, <clears throat> the, the, the danger of a confrontation with the Soviet Union was not so great because of the detente that was inoperative. Much, uh, much more serious was the possibility of a confrontation with China. After all, Rusk himself talked about a billion Chinese overwhelming Asia, and George Murphy and others were talking about if we don't stop them there, they'll come marching down Market Street, Chinese expansionism. That's only been a few years ago. Now, if, if, you, if you then uh, take, on the one hand, the, 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 the escalatory pattern of the air war leading closer and closer to China, in fact, the bombing was very close to China at several points, then what has come out from these documents, namely, an agreement, a policy decision that was made in the administration, namely that if the Chinese come in, or someone construes that they have come in, who knows how the Chinese could come in, someone makes a decision that the Chinese are now in North Vietnam, maybe two Chinese counselors take a walk from the Chinese embassy in Hanoi. That's worse than that. Is, an American intelligence officer reports he heard Chinese <laughs> on, a, on, a, on an intercom. That's well, what so well, that or, happen, you, or you actually. reinterpret work teams now, in the North as soldiers. Mm -hmm. Right, you reinterpret work teams easy, in North right. Vietnam as soldiers. Now, this, I think, gets back to the question, Bill, that uh, sort of the second part of our discussion, the restraints that gradually came in. I think it is true that whereas Johnson came in to his administration with a Vietnam war whoop. It is also true, I think, that from uh, 1965 onward, in a very strange way, he exercised a restraining role. That, uh, in fact, uh, I'd almost be prepared to argue that the sending of 500 to 600,000 American ground troops to, to South Vietnam was an act of moderation. In other words, that, that he, was, he was operating in the context of seeing an air war that was moving closer and closer to China, if that confrontation had occurred, then nuclear weapons uh, could be used, and presumably also the bombing could go on uh, ag against China. And I think there were men in the United States government, I think Dean Rusk is among them, W.W. Mm -hmm. w. Rostow is among them, probably a part of Johnson himself, but some and, of the CIA. and some of the CIA people, who actively wanted a war with China for a variety of reasons. I mean, one was just good old rollback and uh, anti-communist reasons, but for more specific reasons, namely to destroy the developing Chinese nuclear program uh, before it got to the point that, uh, that it could not be destroyed or the Chinese air defenses were of such a nature uh, to make an attack impossible. In 1964, attack by conventional aircraft, B-52s from Thai bases was possible without serious interference from the Chinese. It's no longer possible now. I think her men were pressing that. I think Dean Rusk was particularly pressing that. A man known for his bitter racial hatred of the Chinese. Every statement that he's made has indicated the most hostile, hostile, uh, without limits, hostile attitudes toward China. And that uh, Johnson, I think, uh, became aware of uh, for a variety of reasons. Maybe, as Peter suggested, that every president comes in as a hawk and then for, you know, becomes a dove or a semi-dove or begins to get worried about uh, you know, the extent of these actions. And a series of restraining actions then take place, the most well-known of which were, of course, the, the, the targeting, the fact that there were restrictions on the targets, that the Joint Chiefs kept on pressing for removal of all limits. Mm -hmm. Now, the bombing the Americans carried out was horrible. 
But still, there were a few places that were not bombed. Some of the airfields were not bombed until later. Uh, they weren't bombed right away, even though the military was pressing for it. The military wanted to press the rail lines leading right to China. But, but what are these reasons? Is reality one of them? I mean, we, we, <laughs> talked, li we talked last week about how the intelligence estimates of proposed policies were consistently that those policies would not accomplish the goals that, that they were designed to accomplish. And yet, each of those policies maybe not in turn, maybe out of turn, but but the policy uh, continued to escalate. I mean, how important is reality? How important is is the incredible resistance that the Vietnamese and, and other Indo-Chinese people were able to continue um, in as, as a factor in restraint? Or are there other sources, of internal sources, within the policymaking elite itself and, and thus among conflicting American interests domestically that are more important here. Well, wouldn't it, it, it would seem that, that the, the, the emergence of, of uh, uh, restraining forces uh, within the government itself uh, uh, was perhaps best signified by the fact that, that uh, a report, uh, a study like this, this uh, the Pentagon Papers, you know, uh, was made uh, at a time when, you know, what the papers revealed was an emerging split uh, within the administration over the prosecution of the war. Um, it, it's a very curious thing, and it's something we also all mentioned before, that uh, McNamara comes off so clean in this report, a report which he himself, you know, had commissioned. Uh, uh, and I think this would lead us maybe to, to uh, conclude that, uh, you know, there is an obviously a very, very critical uh, uh, intent and, uh, and, and direction in, in the, uh, the whole study of uh, uh, U.S. foreign policy in Southeast Asia in this Pentagon report. Yeah, can, can I just add, I think one reason limits emerge in, well, this, this conflict we're talking about, it becomes very visible in 67 when uh, Admiral Sharp comes to the Stennis subcommittee and uh, is questioned about uh, the possibility of mining Haiphong Far Harbor or bombing Haiphong Harbor, and that's when we get this report. What had happened then was that the, the, the military had reached the limits which had been laid down in the game plan. We were going to fight a limited war in Indochina, and we were not interested in fighting with China so long as they didn't begin it. And the military tried to win within those limits, and they had escalated and escalated to the point that they were bursting out of those limits, and we were actually shooting down MiGs over Chinese territory. We were, uh, the, I think, uh, between June of 67 and January of 68, we. I, I may be slightly wrong, but we hit, we bombed and strafed apparently deliberately in the order of three Russian ships and I think six Chinese ships. And obviously, this war was beginning to get out of hand. I don't think it's so much that the other people changed their minds about what they did want to do, but it's that, that they saw that this, uh, like the sorcerer's apprentice, they had begun something which was getting too big to handle and they had to crack down on it. Well, on top of that, of course, the Tet Offensive uh, completely smashed uh, our sense of a uh, a smooth victory, a, a battle plan that was going along smoothly and so forth. And that, well, that was part of it, but certainly the Tet is the thing that uh, drove it home and uh, In spurred, on, yes. yeah, mm -hmm. spurred on the forces at home uh, to challenge the, uh, the government. And uh, it seems to me that it's between that, that loss in the field and the increasing pressure, especially with McCarthy and so forth, that uh, made it impossible. That's what begins to impose the limits. Yeah, I mean, Before, I, I, just, just a minute, there was a part of... Uh, Bill's question before about why weren't these intelligence uh, reports listened to, and uh, that I think is uh, is interesting. That should have been a limit, uh, especially if you hear these people talk about how they make decisions and so forth. One of the things that struck me most about these papers is the uh, the use of incredibly uh, old-fashioned uh, moral language at every key turn in the argument. That is, you don't listen to essentially you don't listen to the intelligence because it means weakness. All the intelligence are there, harbingers of weakness and uh, pusillanimity and all the rest of it. Uh, the, the strong man uh, perseveres, and uh, it's almost as though I'd read the I Ching. The strong man perseveres and uh, just fights his way through and so forth, except that one day they woke up and there were people inside of the embassy. <laughs> <laughs> one, one has a feeling, by the way, in reading these, that parts of the Pentagon intelligence system, the, Defense Intelligence Agency and the CIA must have come together for a period of time in terms of their assessments 
because the, the relationship between the CIA analysts whose documents are referred to in the Pentagon is so close that you don't see divergencies in attitudes particularly, which would seem to indicate this was an alliance which had been formed. I, I think also, you know, when one talks about that, that those limits, it's, it's important to realize that in something like intelligence, that I'm convinced that when one looks back, intelligence is almost always ignored. If one goes back into the 40s and looks at the information coming out of China to decision makers, it was very accurate on the whole. Um, and, and the reason decisions were made in Washington as they were was not based upon the field reporting, which was quite accurate on Zhang and the communists. And it's almost to the extent that intelligence follows. It doesn't precede decision making. It justifies. It doesn't yeah. critique. And some, it can yeah. be used as an instrument in a way. I'd, I'd just like to develop that a bit further. I, I, I think that every bureaucratic point of view was able to call upon its kind of intelligence to justify what it was arguing. And, and in fact, I, I've been researching this, what I call intelligence battles, which pre precede key operational decisions, many of them so-called crisis decisions. Well, a good, the best example of this, perhaps, would be the Cambodian invasion, which is technically out of our period, which was preceded by uh, some intelligence sources uh, not only reporting but leaking their reports to the New York Times that uh, the headquarters for the, for the NLF operation in Vietnam was not in Cambodia, being competed by other intelligence authorities, clearly in this case Army, <coughs> saying, yes, uh, there, there is a COSVEN, a headquarters in Cambodia, with an elaborate description of it being, housing 5,000 men being made in concrete, being a, an echo of the Pentagon and underground. That kind of debate precedes the decision. And although we have had in the Pentagon Papers a, a series of dovish intelligence reports. There were, I am sure, for for most of those reports, there were at the same time other intelligence reports which talked Sorry. about the, the 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 step up in North Vietnamese infiltration or whatever it might be to justify going one step up what, in the escalator. What Peter, scale. I'd like to underline what Peter is saying because I think it um, that every bureaucracy or every uh, figure in the bureaucratic uh, figure, all the figures in the bureaucratic conflicts have their own intelligence, so that. Uh, Everybody has his own intelligence estimates that indicate what he wants to know. I think it might be well to point out to our listeners that that also uh, applies very much to the role of academic advisors to the government. That uh, I've heard a lot of people say, well, if the government only had better advisors from the universities, you know, things would have been so bad. And uh, from uh, my own very limited experience, but from a certain amount of observation, I feel that most of these uh, uh, academic advisors are a part of a stable of a particular bureaucracy. So that uh, the right-wing bureaucracies have their right-wing academicians and the liberals have theirs, and so they pride themselves on their Chinese and their like Japanese speech and their writer. Hindustani. You tell them what you want and he writes yeah, a speech. he writes yeah. a speech. And, you know? a, and, and a good man is a man yeah. whom you can count on to deliver what you want from him. Right. Now, I think what, what the papers do show is that, that the, uh, the, the intelligence is immaterial. I mean, it, the intelligence is the instrument, or portions of the intelligence are the instruments of a particular bureaucracy. And the subject that, that Peter Scott has worked on a great deal, the Tonkin, I won't speak for him, but, but he's worked on a great deal, that the, that the key elements in there were intelligence intercepts that were probably manufactured by uh, intelligence agencies to justify a certain policy. Um, but the, the papers do show that the, the, um, where the limitations set in is when the ruling class in the United States, the people who, uh, who exercise great influence, great wealth, uh, begin to make themselves felt. I think the publication by the New York Times, a newspaper that, that uh, uh, is a ruling class newspaper, that when, when uh, that the, the, the publication by the New York Times of, 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 of these documents, I think, must be seen as an intervention on the part of the class of people, uh, the northeastern business interests of the corporate ruling class, into the processes that are being carried out badly by their managers who were, uh, uh, who came into power, either by their appointment or manipulation or election, whatever the case may be. Now, when one looks at the documents, one sees that ruling class intervention uh, occurred at an earlier period. For example, in March uh, 1968, at the key meetings of March 18th and March 25th were meetings with Clark Clifford and Dean Acheson and George Ball and, and other people who came George down George to New York. Bundy, I think, and yeah. George Bundy. A variety of people who came down, f uh, and a number of other corporate executives, I remember reading it at the time, who came down to Washington to give uh, Johnson uh, their advice. Now, they've, they've gone down to Washington all the time, but up to that time, no one had listened to them. 
Uh, but at this point, suddenly Johnson well, listens to up, them. Up to that time, they were defending the war. That's right. I mean, they were that, that's the, war. That's that's the right. difference. Their policy that's right. shifts. That's right. That's right. Their policy shifts. That's right. That's quite correct, Jim. In fact, from about nine, the end of 1967, the stock market gets soft, and yes. the, the first big gold crisis occurs in March of 1968. Yeah. Oh, at this point, <clears throat> then you have a, a, a beginning, a series of, of, of other influences coming in. Of course, they're the influence of the street, too. I think, this, I think we should not underestimate what, what Absolutely. the people did on the street. And the, the, the people on the street toppled Johnson or played a very important role. So that's the third so element. So did the stock least. market. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that, that here you have two, two elements that come in, new elements. One of the people on the street and one of the ruling class people coming in and telling Johnson that something is very wrong with this war and accelerating the process of putting restraints, and, and as, as becomes evident in, in, in late in that month. Uh, now that... Um, I mean, as I say, leaving the street thing aside, the, the, the ruling class comes in for the first time as a countervailing power against uh, the, the fascists and the bureaucracy, the fascists and the militarists in carrying on this war. And I think what you have now at this, at this moment is a, a, uh, a fairly naked confrontation of uh, ruling corporate liberals and fascists, fascist militarists, and that, that poor Nixon is sort of caught in the middle. But between the uh, the military, uh, the the Agnews and the Mitchells and and, and and these people who've developed strong vested interests, and of course their foreign allies like Tio and and Chung Hee Park and Jiang Kai Shek and all the all the riffraff that's been accumulated, fascist riffraff over over the, over the last twenty years, dope peddlers and, <laughs> and so on. And it's a very very interesting because the ruling class has decided the war is not worth continuing any longer. That the loss is far outweigh the gains that could come from it. And my feeling is when newspapers, leading newspapers, who are, and, and, and television networks, no one can tell me that they are the voices of the people. I mean, one simply has to look at the advertising that, that goes on television or, 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 or the newspapers. They are the voice of those people who exercise power uh, and influence and have the predominant corporate wealth in this country. This is a fascinating confrontation, and I think it has occurred in other periods in other countries. And that's what we're witnessing right now. It seems to me there's, there's another angle I'd like to compliment what Fran said about the political impact of these papers. But on the one hand, we are facing a division within the elite, which comes about because of different interests that they have in terms of allocation of resources, great objections to the way in which mil military mismanagement, in a sense, some of the discrediting of parts of the elite, some of the great concern about the what's happening with the Japanese and some of the other allies. It's interesting, for example, that George Ball is one of the great dissenters. Well, who's George Ball? He's partly the man who's both very European prone, but he's also very Japanese prone. And he argued for years that the greatest threat to the war was the destruction of the American-Japanese alliance, that this is what he most feared. Uh, and but Nixon supported the war for the same reason. Yes, he supported <laughs> the war for the same reason. Uh, I think Ball was probably closer to the truth, though. But there's another angle to this uh, in terms of the, of the Pentagon Papers, in terms of what it opens up. And that is, when one reads over these, it hits one, even though one believed it before, about what was essentially a strategy of provocation over the last 25 years by the United States and Asia. And that while there are very basic ideological assumptions which allow people to have, 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 have augmented this policy, which didn't make them reflect too much on it, some of its consequences, um, there, there's a sense in which um, the, the, the process is so consciously one of creating a situation in Asia which justifies our role. There's a document, for example, in, 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 the, in the 54, in which they're discussing the danger of communism to Asia, in which they're consciously thinking out, how do you create a situation over this so it looks like they're calling upon us for right. our assistance? How do you recreate the concept of America as a defensive power? How do you justify our intricate involvement in other people's internal affairs? And there's a kind of an encouragement, in a sense, out of these papers, it seems to me, that for the first time, these kinds of questions will have to be asked in the American body politic. There's a strong implication throughout those papers and a fear that if the American people really knew how things were being done, there would be great opposition, whether it was Geneva or whether it was some of the other sta stands that the American government took. There would have been a political argument, even in the 50s, it seems to me, if it had been known what we actually did at Geneva and the covert operations, the, the, the calling of the Geneva Accords a disaster and how you go about changing them and, and deciding all along not to go along with them. And it's that level of public openness, which is feared in the Pentagon Papers, which is feared by the elite, 
which is now something that's going to have to be faced. And one doesn't come out of those documents, it seems to me, with an ideology from within those kind of people that it's going to be very effective against. Uh, as an ideology, not in the terms of the use of force, but as an ideology against this. And I think there's some encouragement. I think people have written off what the average uh, American person might take in terms of what his government's going to do. And I think there's going to be, hopefully, I mean, there's a potential for this, for a reassessment and understanding of how the government worked. Peter? Uh, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance, and I don't think we should be too uh, sanguine about the fact that these papers have been, uh, have been published, because I think what... France calls the ruling class is not really interested in getting out of Indochina. When you say they're interested in ending the war, you have to remember that the whole Re Eisenhower-Nixon Republican posture towards Southeast Asia was covert intervention through the 50s. And that what Kennedy brought that was new was going from covert to overt, bringing in uh, the military and the Joint Chiefs and so on. I think Nixon's game plan is, and really for some time has been, to go back to covert intervention. And I find it very alarming that a lot of the people who were very prominent in covert operations, uh, uh, men like Martin Hertz and Gordon Jorgensen, uh, who were CIA operatives in uh, Southeast Asia in the late 50s, are back there and into China now. And uh, I think that Cambodia, I think, was originally, you know, seen as a coup and perhaps not really the, the, the full-scale military intervention that we've seen. Maybe something went a bit wrong there for the, for the Nixon game plan. But if all we see is that we go back from the overt operations of the 60s to the covert operations of the 1950s, and meanwhile the, the big oil companies are uh, drilling and establishing their derricks all along the, 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 the coastline of uh, Indochina, the problem is going to be worse. It's going to be more difficult. So that uh, we have to realize just how painful and uh, this pr process of disengagement is going to be and how hard those who are opposed to the war are really going to have to work they can't just sit back now that the Pentagon Papers have been published. Rick? Yeah, this, for me, this takes it back to a question that uh, Jim asked early on, is why did this things get published in such a strange order? It is, if the, if the uh, main conclusion that comes out of them, uh, these papers, is that anti-communism was there as a driving force all along, that it may, may have moved from a somewhat defensive to offensive uh, phase uh, in the early 60s, it still was the driving thing. It's what made people uh, deny intelligence. It's what made, uh, the, the, made the outcomes be uh, necessary in a way. Uh, if that's the, the generalization that comes out of them, then this is far different from the sort of um, conclusions that were, or the positions that were being argued before. Remember, the first uh, Vietnam debate was over whether the war was too costly, at least at the elite level. That's the way it was phrased. There wasn't anything wrong with it. It was a sheer matter of dollars and cents. Then it became a mistake, then maybe a, an aberration when the, uh, when the war crimes thing begins to emerge, but still aberration says it's not in the mainstream of the politics. To When you go to these things, it says, uh, if you read them uh, seriously and, and take out their conclusion, it says that anti-communism is wrong, the Cold War is wrong, the whole policy is wrong. And I think that the Times scrambling of these things is an attempt almost against itself, a sign of its own ambivalence, uh, to try to keep downplay that element and keep it uh, away from the attention of the, at least the mass public. Maybe the, the elite public uh, can be attentive to those things, but it's be kept away from the mass public. And Reston said a few days after the uh, first publications that, well, we've done our role now by publishing these things. Now it should go back to the political realm. Like, the Times wanted to be out of it, you know, and, and to phrase the whole thing in terms of freedom of the press and to just leave it there and to be happy with it as a great constitutional issue seems to me a, a sign that they want that they've done their part to get things rolling, but they don't want to stay with it. They don't want to carry through. And they just as soon have it go back to somewhat covert elite. Where, where I might discussion. raise one question about what you say, though, is uh, how far they do move in these Pentagon Papers. It seems to me it's still at the level of workability and the fact that the great problem was the, uh, the, I the ignoring of the intelligence, particularly coming out of this group which was associated with the Pentagon Papers, which led to mistakes and disaster. But I don't see the reassessment in terms of of basic assumptions about uh, American involvement or economic power or the use of military power in a certain way. What one sees, I think, is not a reassessment in Thailand, not a reassessment in other parts of Southeast Asia, but a, a, a very basic criteria of workability in the Indochina war itself. People followed the wrong intelligence and they followed the wrong advice. 
I'm not convinced it goes any further than that. And that's why I think the papers, in a sense, are explosive. It's written all over that what happened in Indochina was meant to be in, in, for Southeast Asia. I mean, those initial documents link Vietnam to the pattern in Southeast Asia. We're not dealing not with something. Not just Southeast Asia, but uh, <laughs> Asia, <world>. Africa, <laughs> America, yeah. Canada, yeah. And Japan. I mean, I, I, I would think, you know, that, that I, I would sort of, you know, say that, that uh, even though there is that limited scope of workability, constantly you hear this re reiterated, and of course this has been a, uh, a long-term sort of uh, theory of the left about what the war represents, is that it was a laboratory. In these men, in many ways, perhaps, why they were driven on is they felt this was the test, the major test, you know. I mean, this is where we would prove to the world that, that we could, you know, defeat the forces of, of, of revolution, not just in Asia, but, but throughout Latin America and Africa. And, uh, or at uh, least learn how to. Or at least learn how to. Uh, I mean, and, and the one clear fact is when you look at the whole military research and development program is that it got a, it won a tremendous boost from what was going on in Vietnam. Uh, and I, I would think that, that you know, the, the brunt of, uh, or at least one of the, the issues that, that uh, um, would have to be confronted in this type of reassessment uh, would go back to what Rick said, is this whole anti-communist policy. And uh, um, it, 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 it's sort of an ambiguous thing. I think that what you see with the Times is what you see with uh, a similar type of ambiguity with, you know, other liberals like Fulbright and and Proxmire. Uh, I mean, these people, too, look about, uh, as Proxmire puts it, he calls himself a parsimonious hawk. I mean, he wants, he thinks the United States does have a national security problem, but it has to handle this more efficiently. And Fulbright is also for containing communism, but it has to be done in a more humane, with more, you know, uh, more civilized manner, without so much mm. brutality. So, so I think that, that the, this kind of contradiction that Rick points out in the New York Times is something that that is implicit in this one wing of, of the U.S. ruling class that well, does that's, want to It's kind of the point I was trying to get at. In a sense, you can read the Pentagon documents in, in a right, striking way, because one wouldn't assume this is the conclusion, as a defense of expertise in government. What right. the, 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 the stress on anti-communism which comes through is this bewilderment in, in, in this report because it is obfuscating the decision-making process that should have been taking place. And it's at this level, which I think the system is very mystified in this report, that, that, that you don't have to go beyond that. You, if you could, in these Pentagon Papers, remove the, the machismo, the threat on will and stamina that some of these experts had, or the obfuscation of the policy that came through for a variety of different reasons, and you had people who knew what was going on, and these are the ones who were actually making the decisions, then you would have a rational and effective government. And that is why this is very much an elite document. It isn't going to get much further than that. That's why I stress both its limitations and the recognition of the kind of document it really is and, and the kinds of people that put it together. Because Ellsberg seems to me the very symbol of this kind of thinking, which is it's a technocratic approach. If only we could remove domestic emotionalism and emotionalism in the decision-making process and this incredible rhetoric and the military simplicities, we'd have a different kind of government. And I think there is where the great divide is going to occur in the debate in American politics. We've run out of time again. Um, obviously, these discussions are, are not going to stop here, uh, either among the people in this room or among the people listening. But I do want to thank all of you for coming in once again and, and uh, uh, sharing with us uh, your analysis and interpretation. This program was produced by KPFA, Pacifica Radio for Northern California, and distributed by Pacifica Program Service in Berkeley. All rights are reserved.